हे गाइस वेलकम आई थिंक यू आर नाउ एबल टू सी एंड हियर मी बाय द वे आर एबल टू सी एंड हियर मी आर यू विजुअल्स आर फाइन Hi Meet Patel. Good evening. Hi Dr. Sagala. Good evening. Hi Sri Ram. Good evening. Good evening, each and every one. Sorry for the delay. I've tried my best to start the class on time. That's the reason why, like, I've pushed the class to nine thirty today because uh, I know my Saturday OPDs will be a little busy. And yes, today was also like uh, relatively busy, but uh, somehow, like. I think the TNEB had other plans, so we didn't have the power. So somehow I diverted the power and uh, used the same UPS and uh, connected it in a different way so that I got some lighting at least. If you can't see the light properly, then uh, you can let me know. So I think, but otherwise, like the tab and all will be perfect. So I don't think it will be an issue. By the way, so hi everyone, good evening. Thank you very much for all of your patience uh, for waiting this long. yeah let's start so today i thought i'll discuss two topics so one is going to be the rheumatology and immunology and the second one is going to be the gastroenterology part so gastroenterology and hepatology is also equally important i have given a kind of challenging questions to be honest like some of the questions can be really challenging but don't get boggled by that in exams you don't get uh, this kind of questions by the way but uh, i just wanted to train all of you like uh, to think in a better way so that once you think Little complicated, so that you, the questions in exams might be a little easier. So let us move to the first question straight away. So here is your first question: Which of the following statements regarding anaphylaxis is false? So option A states history of atopy is a risk factor for anaphylaxis to penicillin therapy. Option B states onset of anaphylaxis is within seconds to minutes of antigen exposure. Option C states IV glucocorticoids are not effective. For acute anaphylaxis, option D states failure to use epinephrine within 20 minutes of symptoms is a risk factor for death. Risk factor for death. So these are the four options. So they are asking which of the following statements is false regarding anaphylaxis. Dr. Roshan is asking 40 questions in total. Yes, 40 questions in total. 20 plus 20. So let us try to discuss as much as possible. So what do you think is the answer? So option A, B, C, or D. So what is the right answer? So we are asking which of the following is false. I'm getting plenty of answers. Many people are answering B, C. Anyone else got any other answers? Many people are answering B, C. Okay, but uh, honestly. the right answer for this question is technically option a so i don't know whether how many of you would have expected this in the first place the right answer for this question is option a so remember whatever questions i have given in my lecture are all harrison based so there is nothing beyond harrison i have technically taken question only from harrison nothing more than that right answer is a so what you need to know is that history of atopy is not a risk factor for anaphylaxis to penicillin therapy that's a very very important point so for example if somebody is having bronchial asthma or somebody is having history of allergy to common environmental allergens does it mean that person is going to develop penicillin allergy answer is no penicillin allergy is something that's different so okay so completely different entity so it's clearly given in harrison that history of atopy is not a risk factor for anaphylaxis to any drugs for that matter especially beta lactams and penicillin so it is not so what about option number b so that is onset of anaphylaxis within seconds to minutes of antigen exposure that's absolutely correct most of the times the moment you start getting exposed to the antigen the same moment you start experiencing a reaction so that's very 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 correct because anaphylaxis is a kind of a type 1 hypersensitive reaction so what about option c iv glucocorticoids are not effective for acute anaphylaxis that's a correct statement then why do we give steroids so remember for acute anaphylaxis the most important treatment are going to be the iv fluids Anti-histamine drugs, 
probably we're going to uh, um, use some epinephrine. So that is going to be the treatment for acute anaphylaxis. So why we give glucocorticoids? Everyone will be knowing that we are going to give glucocorticoids in all patients with anaphylaxis. But why do we give? That is because to prevent the late reaction. That's called a second wind phenomenon. So there is something called a second wind phenomenon. So where initially you're going to have the first wave and after some time you're going to get the second wave. That is the second wind phenomenon. So to prevent this second reaction, the future reaction, we are going to give IV glucocorticoids. So the first initial acute anaphylaxis has to be treated in a different way. Okay, so steroids are not effective for acute anaphylaxis is correct statement. And finally, last but not the least, option D, failure to use epinephrine within 20 minutes of symptom onset is a risk factor for death. That's absolutely correct. So treat as soon as possible. Okay, it's IM or IV, it doesn't matter. You have to treat as soon as possible. You have to use within 20 minutes of onset of symptoms. It's clearly given in Harrison. If you're going to use epinephrine late, it's not going to have that much effect. The risk of death is going to be high in that regards. So all three options, B, C, D are correct. The only thing that is wrong is A. History of atopy is never ever a risk factor for anaphylaxis to penicillin therapy. So, but that's fine. So how you're going to manage a patient with hypersensitive reaction? I'll tell you how to manage. First of all, whenever someone comes with arctic area, I'll repeat, whenever somebody comes with arctic area, what do you need to see? Or maybe we can say angioedema. So we can split an angioedema with arctic area and without arctic area. Let us assume whenever presence with something called as angioedema. Whenever someone presents with angioedema, you're going to split into two, whether they have arctic area or they don't have arctic area or they don't have arctic area no arctic area. Arctic area versus no arctic area. In case if the patient presents with arctic area, what are you going to think? You're going to think about the classic type 1 hypersensitive reaction. So what are you going to think? You're going to think about a classic type 1 hypersensitive reaction. So which is typically Ig mediated, but we have non Ig mediated anaphylactoid reactions as well. So when it is not related to Ig, it's called anaphylactoid reactions. If it's classic Ig mediated, it's a typical type 1 anaphylactic reaction. So how you're going to treat? So remember, whenever a patient is suffering from anaphylaxis, the A, B, Cs are almost, al almost always important, which means the airway breathing circulation. You have to take care of the vitals first. So if the patient is in shock, if the patient is in shock, you have to give IV fluids. This is a very important question. Many times we forget these basic ideologies. You have to give IV fluids. And you have to give vasopressors like adrenaline. Everyone knows the dosage of adrenaline in the setting of anaphylactic shock. It's going to be 1 is to 1000. You're going to give 0.5 to 1 milligram, typically a dose of 1 milligram. And you can inject adrenaline IM as soon as possible. This is extremely important. Okay, IV fluids, typically we're going to prefer crystalloids like normal saline or ringed lactate, typically a normal saline in most common situations. And adrenaline, very, very important. Plus, additionally, I'll be giving antihistaminics. Okay, I'll be giving glucocorticoids, we can write corticosteroids, correct, so I'm going to give, so but remember corticosteroids I'm going to give to prevent the second wind phenomenon, the later reaction that's going to occur after 24 to 36 hours, many patients experience that worsening after 24 to 36 hours in the setting of type 1 hypersensitive reaction, to prevent that I'm going to use corticosteroids, but nevertheless I'm going to use all of this therapy, don't forget IV fluids, don't forget adrenaline. Okay, these are very, very important acute treatments as far as anaphylaxis is concerned. Okay, so what about patients who don't present with arctic area? If somebody don't have arctic area. So this is where you're going to think about a possible bradykinin excess. It's very likely that the angioedema is going to be due to bradykinin excess. Okay, bradykinin excess. So what are the causes of bradykinin excess? So there are multiple reasons for bradykinin excess. It could be due to drugs, okay? Certain drugs can cause bradykinin excess or it could be due to uh, your C1 inhibitor deficiency, defect. That's called a C1 inhibitor defect. There are two reasons. Okay, so what are the drugs that can cause bradykinin excess? Two drugs, one AC inhibitors, Rest assured, it is definitely not due to ARBs. ARBs don't cause bradykinin excess. You can strike it off. That's a very important point. It's only the ACE inhibitors that are going to 
cause bradykinin in excess and second group of drugs that can cause bradykinin in excess can anyone say so what are the second drug second group of drugs that tend to cause bradykinin in excess anyone anyone okay let me tell it is rnas that's a very very important point so this is an upcoming drug that can cause angioedema rnas what are rnas these are angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors so the best example is succubitril valsartan component but can anyone say either succubitril or valsartan which is going to cause angioedema it's actually the succubitril component that's the one that is implicated in angioedema not valsartan valsartan is an angiotensin receptor block i told you very clearly that it's not going to cause angioedema it's the succubitril component that's going to cause angioedema why because succubitril is a neprilysin inhibitor the same neprilysin enzyme is going to metabolize bradykinin as well if you're going to give a succubitril inhibitor i mean if you're going to give a neprilysin inhibitor like succubitril the metabolism of bradykinin also will be affected so there will be bradykinin in excess so this is going to be a future question okay don't forget that and next what about the c1 inhibitor defect this could be hereditary or this could be acquired hereditary hereditary in the sense you're going to have family history you're going to have low complement levels especially low c3 very very common and there will be history of attacks during emotions that's very very important that's why it's called as hereditary angioneurotic edema once upon a time we used that name angioneurotic edema why because attacks of angioedema in the setting of hereditary angioedema tends to worsen tends to increase with emotions either positive as well as negative emotions hereditary or acquired so what are the causes of acquired angioedema number 1 connective tissue disorders the best example is sle systemic lupus erythematosus we are going to have antibodies against the c1 esterase that's going to inhibit the c1 esterase acquired causes will be due to antibodies second certain lymphoproliferative disorders the best example cll where b cells will be abnormal and that will produce abnormal antibodies and that can act against the c1 esterase and can cause decrease decline in the c1 esterase activity so these are the acquired causes but how you will treat angioedema without urticaria in the sense it is due to bradykinin excess how are you going to treat this if it's going to be due to drug related causes stop the drug that's very very important if it's going to be due to c1 esterase defect then if it's acquired then you can treat the underlying cause that's also fine but how you are going to manage an acute attack how you are going to manage an acute attack there are two drugs that you need to know for exams or for prophylaxis what are the drugs that you can use two drugs very important for exams one a bradykinin receptor blocker and the second one is going to be the calicrine inhibitor calicrine inhibitor because we know that bradykinin is going to uh get secreted because of calicrine only because calicrine is the one that stimulates the production of bradykinin where high molecular weight kinogen will be converted to low molecular weight kinins like bradykinin so what is bradykinin receptor inhibitor we have a drug called as ecartibunt we have a drug called as ecartibunt so the name itself says that bradykinin antagonist bunt bradykinin antagonist So second, we have a calicrine inhibitor that's called as ecalantide, right? Ecalantide. Again, the name itself says that it's a calicrine inhibitor, ecalantide. So it's a calicrine inhibitor or calicrine antagonist, ecalantide. So these are the two drugs. Trust me, it may be asked in exams. Ecartibunt, ecalantide. So these are drugs that are going to be useful in the setting of bradykinin excess related angioedema. Hope you all get it. So how to have a good approach towards angioedema you have to see first whether it is with urticaria or without urticaria then you are going to deal accordingly so the right answer for this question is option a you know why now let us move on to the second question what is the immune mechanism leading to organ damage in good pasteur syndrome so which means we know 
The background problem is good pasteur syndrome, where you're going to have anti-glomerular basement membrane antibodies, anti-GBM antibodies. So which of the following is the immune mechanism that is going to result in good pasteur syndrome? Antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity, complement activating autoantibody, inactivating antibody, stimulating antibody. What is your answer? So what's your take? So I'm getting plenty of answers mentioning option A as the right answer. Antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity or complement activating autoantibody or inactivating autoantibody or stimulating autoantibody. I'll discuss the differences between epinephrine and norepinephrine in a while, Dr. Devesh. Don't worry about that. So many of you are right and wrong at the same time. The right answer for this question is complement activating autoantibody. Right answer for this question is option B. Okay, so this is a kind of a straight Harrison based question. So let us have a look at this table. Have a look at this table. This is an exact table that is given in Harrison. So I've just concised it and I've just simplified it, nothing more than that. So look at this table. So we have multiple mechanisms of probably antibodies causing diseases. So these are basically because of type 2 hypersensitive reactions. You can see there are plenty of disorders that are due to blocking or inactivating antibody. What are the best examples? You know myasthenia gravis, right? Myasthenia gravis is due to acetylcholine receptor antibody. It's due to acetylcholine receptor antibody. But the antibody will be targeted specifically against the alpha chain of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Even this is an exam question. You might think in what way that is important. You might think in what way that's important, the alpha chain, how does it matter? So many people know that acetylcholine receptor antibody will be associated with something called as thymoma. Everyone knows that acetylcholine receptor antibody is going to be associated with thymoma. In how many cases? 15% of the cases you will have thymoma. Mycena gravis may be due to thymoma. And this acetylcholine receptor antibody, if it's targeted against the NM type, that is neuromuscular junction type, this will result in myasthenia gravis. Suppose if acetylcholine receptor antibody is associated with small cell lung cancer, have you ever heard of an acetylcholine receptor antibody association with small cell lung cancer? If it is associated and in this case, if it targeted against the NM type, NN type, the NN type of acetylcholine receptors, this disease will not cause myasthenia gravis. Rather, this disease will cause ganglionopathy. Ganglionopathy, right? This disease is going to cause something called as ganglionopathy. This is given in Harrison as well. See, Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome is different. That is due to anti voltage gated calcium channel antibodies. That is not due to acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome is due to anti voltage gated calcium channel antibodies against PQ type of calcium channels. They are not acetylcholine receptor antibodies. I'll repeat. So, this is autonomic ganglionopathy caused by NN type. Okay, antibodies against NN type produced by small cell lung cancer. So this is kind of a future question that you might get in exam. Okay, very important point, high yielding point. So I'm sure that many people would have learned something new today with regards to that NN type going to result in ganglionopathy, not LEMS. Because in exam, the LEMS option will be very tempting. Okay, coming to Antiphospholipid syndrome, you know that uh, it's going to be, yeah, it's a paraneoplastic uh, syndrome of small cell lung cancer. That's correct. One of the paraneoplastic syndromes. Correct. So phospholipid aspect of glycoprotein 1 complex, that's fine. Okay. So that's going to result in antiphospholipid syndrome. And if the antibodies is going to be targeted against insulin receptor, it's going to result in something called as insulin resistant diabetes mellitus. If the antibodies are going to be targeted against intrinsic factor it's going to result in a disease called as pernicious anemia we all know that 
And what about the stimulating antibodies? So we have plenty of stimulating antibodies. The best example is the TSH receptor stimulating antibody called as LADS antibodies seen in Graves disease. And you also have to know that uh, the anti-PR3 antibody that is CS C Anka, C Anka anti-PR3 antibody is basically a stimulating antibody that is seen in vaginous granulomatosis. That is granulomatosis with polyangitis. And then we have something called epidermal catherine and desmoglein 3 antibodies. So when you talk about desmoglein 3 antibodies, it is going to be pemphigus vulgaris. Everyone knows that. And then we have some antibodies that can cause complement activation. So that is where you get good pasture syndrome. This is the only thing that is given, okay, under complement activating antibody. So against what chain the antibody is directed against the alpha 3 chain of collagen 4? This is already a question in the exam. So against the alpha 3 chain of type 4 collagen, you are going to have antibody and that is an antibody that is going to cause complement activation. That is the one that is going to cause good pasture syndrome. Only one example you have been having in uh, textbooks and that is why that point is very important. So there are some antibodies that result in immune complex formation. The best example is anti-DSDNA antibody seen in SLE systemic lupus erythematosus. And we have rheumatoid factor. What is rheumatoid factor? Let me explain what is rheumatoid factor. You are going to have uh, antibody, okay, very commonly an IgG antibody. And if you are going to form antibody against the FC portion, you know this is the variable portion or we can say call it as the fragment of antigen binding. So that is a FAB region. And here is the FC region. If you are going to form antibody against the FC portion of your IgG, this is what we call it as rheumatoid factor. Technically, rheumatoid factor can be of IgM type or IgA type or IgD type, any type. But in laboratories, we measure only the IgM type of rheumatoid factor. That is the one that is quantified in the laboratories. That is why when you talk about rheumatoid factor in practice, it is always IgM type antibody only. These are nothing but antibodies that are targeted against the FC portion of the IgG. That is rheumatoid factor. You know what is the problem with rheumatoid factor? You are going to get rheumatoid arthritis. Everyone knows that. So there are some antibodies that result in obscenization, which means they are going to coat the tar target antigen and they are going to make that antigen tasty for the macrophages in the spleen to swallow them. Example, antibodies against platelet GP2B3A going to result in disease called as immune thrombocytopenic purpura. Antibodies against RH antigens and I antigen is going to result in autoimmune hemolytic anemia. We all know that. And finally, last but not the least, final mechanism is going to be antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity, which means antibodies when they bound to a target antigen that's going to trigger the CD8 cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which are going to kill that target. Example, anti TPO antibody an anti-thyroglobal antibody that's going to result in development of something called as Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Okay, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So now we can understand this is such an important table. You have so much of relevant information in this table. So please don't ignore this table. That's one of the very, very important tables in rheumatology. Okay, so now you can understand that the right answer for this question is complement activating antibody because we are talking about good pasture syndrome. In good pasture syndrome, you are going to see complement activating antibody that is targeted against the alpha 3 chain of collagen type 4. Alright, next let us move on to the next question. So all of the following are predisposing factors for SLE except option A C3 deficiency, option B female sex, option C HLA DR alleles and option D TREX1 mutations, TREX1 mutations. So which of the following is incorrect? So one minute time for you guys. So I want you all to answer in the first place. Okay, so many people are answering C for that matters. But the right answer for this question is going to be option A. It is C3 deficiency. That's the right answer. So technically C3 deficiency will not result in the development of systemic lupus erythematosus. So female sex, yes, definitely a risk factor. HLDR alleles, yes, definitely a risk factor. TREX1 mutations, definitely a risk factor because it starts with X chromosome and of course like uh, females are at more risk because this is a gene that's located in X chromosome. You can imagine probably like TREX1 mutations are going to be uh, increasing the risk of development of SLE but why not C3 deficiency? Remember currently, I'll tell you the pathophysiology in SLE in a nutshell. 
the main problem is they are not able to clear the apoptotic bodies properly. So whatever um, cells that have died naturally, physiologically in the form of apoptosis, that particles have not been removed properly. So one of the major reasons for why they are not removed properly is defective complements. Complement in sense, which complement specifically? The early classic complements. Okay, they are the ones that are going to be defective in the setting of SLE usually. So when you talk about complement pathways, how can I simplify and tell the complement pathways? You have C1Q, which is going to activate C2, which in turn, and C2 and C4 maybe. So then it's going to activate C3. C3 is the common pathway. Then C3 is going to activate the terminal attack complex C5 to C9. On the other hand, you have factor B and properdin. Factor B and properdin. Okay. So that's going to straight away activate the C3 common pathway, which is going to result in uh, activation of C5 to C9 terminal attack complex. So this is the classic pathway. This is going to be the alternate pathway and we have mannose bind and lectin pathway. I'm not going to talk about that. And this is going to be the common pathway. Here your C3 is going to be the common pathway. And C5 to C9 is terminal attack complex. This is the complement pathway in a nutshell. So what is going to result in development of SLE? this area okay this is the one that's going to result in development of sle especially the c1q deficiency especially the sorry especially the c1q deficiency and c2 c4 deficiency this is the one that's going to result in development of sle so deficiencies of classic complement especially early classic complements like c1q or probably c4 to some extent C2. These are the ones that are related to SLE, not deficiencies of common pathway C3. This is not related to SLE development. If they ask you one of the strongest environmental factors that are associated with development of SLE, it is Epstein-Barr virus. Please don't forget it. One of the strongest environmental risk factors for development of SLE, Epstein-Barr virus. UV rays has been thought to be a risk factor for development of SLE because most of the like lesions in SLE are photosensitive. We all know that. So UV rays, please don't forget that. So Epstein Barr virus, don't forget that. Female sex, yes. Some HLA DR alleles, yes. Trex1 mutations, yes. All of these things. Even smoking has been mentioned as a risk factor for development of SLE. All of this have been a risk factor for development of SLE, except in this case, it's C3 deficiency. That's the right answer. Option A. Coming to the next question. They're going to answer. Yes, even silica has been proposed. Correct. So what about uh, question four? Look at this question. You have a 32-year-old woman with SLE presenting with new cardiac murmur. She has no other symptoms. Echo shows a vegetation on the mitral valve. Which of the following statements is false? So option A states blood cultures are unlikely to be positive. Option B states glucocorticoid therapy has not been proven to be effective. Option C states pericarditis is frequently present concomitantly. And option D says the lesion has high risk of embolization. Which of the following statements is false? So the right answer for this question is option C. Pericarditis is frequent uh, manifestation that is going to occur along with this condition why because here we are going we are actually talking about a condition called as Libman Sachs endocarditis LSC we're talking about Libman Sachs endocarditis remember these vegetations are sterile vegetations sterile vegetations because these vegetations are sterile your blood cultures are unlikely to be positive correct statement that's a correct statement Glucocorticoid therapy has not been proven to be effective. Yes, this is the exact line that is mentioned in Harrison. If you're talking about Libman Sachs endocarditis, glucocorticoid therapy has not been shown to be effective or any other immunosuppressive therapy also has not shown to be very effective in this setting. And because it's a vegetation, this has a decent risk of embolization, like your infected endocarditis, even though it's not infected. But this 
can embolize and can cause problems like stroke. So that's also correct. Pericarditis frequently present concomitantly. No, that's wrong. Even though most common cardiac manifestation in SLE, if they ask you most common cardiac manifestation, so what is the most common cardiac manifestation? It is pericarditis. What is the most common pulmonary manifestation? It is pleuritis. That is the most common pulmonary manifestation. And what is the most common abdominal manifestation? Most common GAT manifestation, that is peritonitis. And these are not infectious, rather these are non-infectious, inflammation of the serocell structures. That is the reason why serocytis as such is going to be very, very important when it comes to SLE. Many of the patients with mild disease typically tend to have recurrent serocytis, mild to moderate disease, rather than having organ damage. This is very, very common and classic in a patient with systemic lupus erythematosus. So even though they have serocytis very commonly, Lipman Sachs endocarditis is a different entity. Often they don't occur along with serocytis, pericarditis. These are separate manifestations. So they are sterile, so culture is negative. No immunosuppressive therapy has proven to be effective in the setting of Lipman Sachs endocarditis and it tends to occur as an isolated finding without pericarditis generally. They don't have other features. And lesion tends to have high risk of embolization because they are nothing but vegetation. They can easily break off and they can go elsewhere. So going to question number five. So all of the following statements regarding antiphospholipid syndrome is true or antiphospholipid antibodies are true except so option A states antiphospholipid antibodies are directed against phospholipids. Option B states those who have lupus anticoagulant will have elevated partial thromboplastin time that corrects with mixing studies. Option C states majority of the patients with SLE and antiphospholipid antibodies develop antiphospholipid syndrome. Option D states beta 2 glycoprotein is central to the pathogenesis of antiphospholipid syndrome. So, which of the following is correct? So, who wants to answer this? Which of the following is true? Which of the following is true? Come on. Because rheumatology is a kind of an overlap section. It, go, it uh, overlaps with orthopedics. It overlaps with pathology. It overlaps with many other subjects. Like for example, sometimes dermatology as well. I mean, at a neat PG level, I'm not discussing much. I just want to go to the questions. I'm not going to the details basically. So the following statements is true. So many people are answering A, B. Okay, so whatever. So the right answer for this question is actually option D. Beta 2 glycoprotein 1 is central to the pathogenesis of antiphospholipid syndrome. So look at this, uh, this table. I told you clearly, right? So if you have listened to this table carefully, you will be able to easily answer this. So look at this. So I told you in the table itself that the beta 2 glycoprotein 1 complex and antibodies against the beta 2 glycoprotein 1 complex is crucial for the development of antiphospholipid syndrome. In fact, this molecule is central okay, to the development of antiphospholipid syndrome. Okay, We call it as APS. So right answer for this question is going to be option D. So why other options are correct? Antiphospholipid antibodies, these are APLs. Antiphospholipid antibodies are generally directed against phospholipids. That's, that's actually not a correct statement. That's a misnomer. So these are basically antibodies that are targeted against molecules that bind phospholipids. Okay, these are antibodies against certain proteins that bind phospholipids. Like for example, annexin A. What, there are plenty of examples we can say that bind phospholipids. Rather, they are not direct phospholipid antibodies. They are antibodies against proteins that bind phospholipids. That's the right statement. They are not directly directed against phospholipids. What about, so this is wrong. What about option B? Those who have lupus anticoagulant will have elevated partial thromboplastin that corrects with mixing studies. It's wrong. So you know whenever a patient is having elevated partial thromboplastin time, PTT, what are you going to do? Mixing studies. So what do you mean mixing studies? Mixing studies means you're going to do a 50-50 mix. Okay, 50-50 mix, which means 50% patient and 50% normal plasma. So if PTT corrects, if the partial thromboplastin time corrects with mixing studies, you're going to talk about 
clotting factor deficiency okay it's a deficiency like pro probably hemophilia if it doesn't correct if the mixing studies does not correct or if addition of uh, normal plasma does not correct the partial thromboblastin time it indicates a clotting factor inhibitor which means there is an inhibitor of clotting factor so this could be antiphospholate antibodies or this could be something else like uh, in hemophilia patients tend to develop clotting factor inhibitors in the form of antibodies because you give factor 8 again and again in hemophilia some patients do develop antibodies against that factor 8 these are called as factor 8 antibodies and can be seen in some patients like multi uh, gravida patients and patients who have received numerous blood transfusions in those people also so remember antiphospholipid antibody is a kind of a clotting factor inhibitor you can put it in that way but rather they are going to inhibit the phospholipids proteins that bind with phospholipids so usually antiphospholipid if it's an antiphospholipid antibody syndrome it will not correct with 50 50 mixing of normal plasma rather it will correct with excess phospholipids rather it's going to correct with excess phospholipids because these are anti-phospholipid antibodies right mm -hmm. so when you add excess phospholipids that inhibition may be lost and they're going to inhibit competitively so that inhibition can be lost okay so that's the reason why ptt alone will be affected but uh, it will not rather correct with mixing studies rather it will correct with excessive phospholipids that's a wrong statement not does not correct with mixing studies. rather it's going to correct with excess phospholipids that's a right statement so that would have been a right statement but that's not given so this is also a wrong option so what about option c majority of the patients with sle and antiphospholipid antibodies develop antiphospholipid syndrome this is also wrong only 10 to 20 percent of them develop antiphospholipid syndrome majority of the patients who have antiphospholipid antibodies do not really develop antiphospholipid syndrome only very few develop antiphospholipid syndrome so option c is also wrong the right answer for this question is option D, beta glycoprotein 1 is central to the pathogenesis of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. So let me give you a glimpse of what is APS. So what, I mean, you, you should have clinical presentation. How will you diagnose APS? So APS is diagnosed based on both clinical as well as laboratory criteria. So what are the clinical criteria? So three things. One is recurrent pregnancy loss, previously called as bad obstetric history, the exact definition not needed for exams. Second, you're going to have thrombotic history okay thrombosis thrombosis it could be arterial or venous thrombosis this is one of the disease that can produce both arterial and venous thrombosis even though venous thrombosis risk is much much higher than arterial thrombosis okay what are the laboratory features you should have any one of the antibodies first of all any one clinical feature should be there and we have three antibodies out of these three antibodies any one of the antibodies should be positive so what are the three antibodies we have anti cardiolipin antibody simply i can write as acl either igm or igg acl igm or igg that is uh, anti cardiolipin antibody igm or igg second is going to be the lupus anticoagulant third will be the anti beta 2 glycoprotein 1 gp1 anti beta 2 glycoprotein 1 so out of these three any one if it is present along with one of the clinical feature then only are going to make a diagnosis of antiphospholipid syndrome so if only antibodies are present it's not antiphospholipid syndrome please understand you cannot make a diagnosis of APS it's just isolated presence of antibodies so that will not uh, tell you that the patient is having APS and one more thing is you need to prove that the antibodies are positive after 12 weeks also so you have to test twice so you have to test twice when you have to test first you have to test once then again you have to test once and that should be at least 12 weeks later or three months later so two times the antibody should be positive consistently it should be positive so if it's not positive for the second time then it's a transient antiphospholipid presence in the body which is something that can be caused by any many other conditions including certain fever drugs and so on so that's why you need to test after 12 weeks prove that it is positive after 12 weeks or 3 months also then only you can say that the antibody is positive okay that's a very important point coming to question number six a 65 year old woman with 10 year history of 
untreated rheumatoid arthritis present to your clinic with worsening joint pain and malice over the last six months on examination she has massive splenomegaly please note that point lab study shows neutropenia elevated crp and anemia which of the following is the most important differential is it acute myeloid leukemia or is it chronic lymphocytic leukemia or is it essential thrombocytosis or is it T cell LGL? LGL stands for large granular lymphocytic leukemia. So what is the right answer? 65 year old woman coming with rheumatoid arthritis, massive splenomegaly, coming with neutropenia, elevated CRP and anemia. What is the most important differential? So 10 seconds for you. The right answer for this question is going to be the T cell LGL, that is T cell large granular lymphocytic leukemia. So technically what you are thinking, so you are thinking about something called as Felty syndrome. So that's what this patient is having. So what is the triad of Felty syndrome? Everyone should know about it. So what is Felty syndrome technically? Felty syndrome is a triad of late and severe rheumatoid arthritis or erosive forms of rheumatoid arthritis and many of them will be having very high titers of rheumatoid factor number one so first part of the triad is rheumatoid arthritis what is second part of the triad you're going to have massive splenomegaly you're going to have massive splenomegaly and the third part of the triad is leukopenia and among the leukopenic components the most specific is the neutropenia so you're going to have neutropenia so this is Felty syndrome so what is the closest differential diagnosis of LT syndrome? So which means something in rheumatoid arthritis can present in the same way like LT syndrome. Exact same presentation like that of LT syndrome in rheumatoid arthritis. What is that? That is T cell LGL can present in the exact same way as that of rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, T cell LGL. That's called as large granular lymphocytic leukemia. How will you differentiate then? So how can you tell that it is actually T cell LGL and not Felty syndrome. You have to look at the peripheral smear. In the peripheral smear, you will see large granular lymphocytes that will be there in the peripheral smear. The LGLs will be positive and they will have the classic markers CD16 and 57 will be positive. CD16 and CD57 will be positive and you can prove the clonality. These will be clonal cells. Whenever you talk about clonal cells, same type of cells, clones, it's malignancy. So this is in fact the only way to prove that it is uh, T cell LGL or not T cell LGL. So you have to look at the peripheral smear. Look for the large granular lymphocytes. These are large cells, lymphocytic architecture, but with granules. That's why it's called as large granular lymphocytes. CD 1657 positive. And they will have clonality. All the cells will have the same kind of histo I mean, uh, immunohistochemistry. And they have same flow cytometric profile. So that is the closest differential because rheumatoid arthritis itself is going to increase the risk of T cell LGL as well. But what is the most common malignancy in rheumatoid arthritis? So let me talk about the most common in rheumatoid arthritis. If you talk about the most common joint that is affected, it's going to be the MCP joint that's the most common that's affected most common cardiac manifestation pericarditis most common pulmonary manifestation pleuritis okay most common pulmonary manifestation pleuritis and many times they will have large pleural effusions and one of the classic forms of large pleural effusion is going to be and one of the classic findings in the large pleural effusion that are associated with rheumatoid arthritis is the fact that they're going to have very low glucose levels very low glucose levels so large blue lymphocytes with very low glucose levels and the most common eye manifestation in rheumatoid arthritis is sika syndrome keratoconjunctivitis sika one of the most important negative points that you need to know with regards to the eye manifestation of rheumatoid arthritis is the fact that they never ever cause anterior uveitis they won't cause uveitis anterior uveitis is a manifestation of zero negative arthropathies Antibiotics never ever occur in zero positive arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis. It's not possible. If there is one thing that doesn't occur with rheumatoid arthritis that is antibiotics. Please keep that in your mind. Never answer that wrong. Multiple times ask question. And most common cancer in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, it's NHL, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. In that, the most common subtype will be DLBCL. Okay, DLBCL, most common subtype. 
most common cancer is NHL, most common subtype is going to be the DLBCL type of NHL. It's a B cell NHL. And most common cause of death in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, cardiovascular risk. Okay, CV death, MI. Okay, most common cause of death in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. And what is the HLA that is associated with rheumatoid arthritis? It is DR4. Okay, HLA DR4. That's the one that's associated with rheumatoid arthritis. It's a very, very important point as well. So these are some of the important points and the most commons that are important for exams. But remember, this could be a future question. Felty syndrome, think about T-cell LGL. That is large granular lymphocytic leukemia. The only way to differentiate is to look at the peripheral smear and prove the clonality of this large granular lymphocytes. That's the only way to prove. Otherwise, you can't prove the T-cell LGL. So this is Felty syndrome, differential diagnosis, T-cell LGL. Remember, T-cell LGL risk is also going to be very high in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. It's not like they don't cause T-cell LGL. So coming to question number seven. So patients with rheumatoid arthritis are at higher risk of all of the following except colorectal cancer, coronary artery disease, hypoandrogenism, lymphoma. Colorectal cancer, this is actually a PYQ. It's a previous year question. So all of the following are going to occur at higher incidence in patients with rheumatoid arthritis except colorectal cancer, coronary artery disease, hypoandrogenism, lymphoma. The right answer for this question is going to be colorectal cancer. Okay. So this is already a question. I don't know why you are not answering the PYQs correctly. Remember, this is one of the neat 20 uh, 17 or 2018 question is clearly mentioned that uh, hypoandrogenism is the feature of rheumatoid arthritis. In fact, males will experience this hypoandrogenism and it can be uh, possibly symptomatic as well. And it's already asked in 2017, 2018. They asked like all of the following are true except answer is hypoandrogenism. I mean hyperandrogenism. Patients don't have hyper rather they will have hypo. That's a correct statement. Coronary artery disease definitely yes. I told you already it's the most common cause of death. Lymphoma, definitely yes. I told you some time ago, most common cancer is NHL and the most common type is DLBCL and hypoandrogenism is also something that can occur in rheumatoid arthritis. So what doesn't occur is solid organ tumors. So rheumatoid arthritis doesn't increase the risk of solid organ tumors. Like, why coronary artery disease? This is an autoimmune disorder, man. It's a disease of chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation is going to damage your vessels. If it damages your vessels, think what will happen. Obviously, you're going to result in high rates of death due to cardiovascular cause like coronary artery disease and MI. So this is a gold standard point. Okay, so the no increased risk of solid organ tumors. I'll repeat no increased risk of solid organ tumors. One small exception is lung cancer. Small increased risk of lung cancer is there. Small increased risk of lung cancer is there. But apart from that, rheumatoid arthritis is something that's not going to increase the risk of any solid organ tumor no matter what except a little bit increase risk of lung cancer. That's it. So right answer is colorectal cancer. So coming to question number eight, all of the following agents have been shown to have disease modifying active in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, except I think this is pretty easy question. Again, a PYQ, it's a previous year question. So I have given a right mix of a good number of PYQs as well as new questions. So all of the following agents have been shown to have disease modifying activity in patients with RA, except infliximab, Leflunomide, methotrexate, naproxen. See, because rheumatoid arthritis is very, very important topic. When it comes to rheumatology, I've given like two to three questions. Yes, correct. So many of you are answering correct already. That is naproxen because this is a NS8. This is an NS8 and NS8s don't have disease modifying activity as far as rheumatoid arthritis is, I mean, as far as any uh, disease is concerned. They are just anti-inflammatory drugs. They are not disease modifying drugs. So how will you treat rheumatoid arthritis? Simple, straightforward. So you have the base, which will be either methotrexate or leflunomide or a combination of both. That's going to be the base. So generally that's what is constituting the base of treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, the first line treatment in most patients. And on top of that, if the patient is not responding, you can add sulfazalazine and HCQ, that is hydroxychloroquine. That's a second line drug. So once a patient is going to take all these three drugs, methotrexate, sulfazalazine, hydroxychloroquine, that's called as triple therapy, which is very, very famous. If the patient doesn't respond to this also, on top of that, you can either uh, replace all these drugs with the biologicals or you can add biologicals on top of these drugs. 
So fine, biologicals are approved for monotherapy also. But if you want, you can use these drugs on top of that, you can add biologicals. So what are the biologicals that are important in rheumatoid arthritis? One, it's going to be the anti-TNF drugs. These are the first line biologicals that we use because TNF alpha is a kind of a signature molecule in rheumatoid arthritis. So you have five anti-TNF drugs. I'm not going to write because it's not important. I mean, in the sense everyone knows already in pharmacology, you have read what are the five important drugs? Five, five important anti-TNF drugs. So we have infliximab, etanercept, golimumab, adalimumab, cetolizumab, pegol. In India, commonly used drugs are going to be infliximab, etanercept and adalimumab. Cetolizumab and golimumab is not very commonly available in India. The remaining three drugs is something that's very commonly used. For example, I am a big fan of adalimumab. I use very commonly in most of my patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And what about other options? We have anti-IL-6 options, anti-IL-6 receptor inhibitor. There are two drugs in that. We have tocilizumab and we have sarilumab. I'll repeat tocilizumab, sarilumab, IL-6 receptor inhibitor. And we have anti-CD20 blockers as well. Anti-CD20 blockers as well. The best example is rituximab. Okay, so because rheumatoid arthritis is something that's going to have a high antibody burden, rituximab is very helpful in this regards. And we have CTLA-4 fusion product. CTLA-4 fusion antibody. So remember, this is not anti-CTLA-4. When they talk about anti-CTLA-4, you have to talk about uh, epilimumab that is used as an immune checkpoint inhibitor for some cancers like advanced metastatic melanoma. So epilimumab is an anti-CTLA-4 monoclonal antibody. But what we are talking about here is CTLA-4 fusion antibody, not anti-CTLA-4, which means this is going to contain CTLA-4. This is not a molecule that's going to act against CTLA-4, rather it's going to contain CTLA-4 in it, that is cytotoxic T lymphocyte antigen number 4. So what is that? We have two drugs, abetacept and beletacept, but abetacept is approved to be used in rheumatoid arthritis, but beletacept is more of your, uh, I, I mean, post Transplant drug. So in post-transplant situations, you're going to use beletacept, but abetacept is approved for rheumatoid arthritis. Sept. So name itself tells sept. Sept means it's a fusion protein. So that's sept. It's not a monoclonal antibody, but still given parenterally. It's a, it's a protein. And we have novel therapies on top of that. You can try if you want. So in case if you can't use biologicals, if the patient is having some contraindication to biologicals or the patient has developed some adverse effects to biological agents, you can try these novel therapies. So what are the novel therapies? The most important novel therapies are going to be jacinibs. So what are the two jacinibs that are approved? One is tofacitinib and second one is going to be baricitinib. Tofacitinib and baricitinib. So what about tofacitinib? Tofacitinib inhibits JAK1, 2, 3, all three receptors, non-selective JAK inhibitor. Baricitinib is going to inhibit JAK1 and JAK2 specifically, okay? Tofacitinib is going to inhibit all three, JAK1, 2, 3, all three. Baricitinib is going to be inhibited. Baricitinib is going to inhibit JAK1 and 2 specifically, not uh, all three. So both are approved. Everyone knows that tofacitinib, I mean baricitinib has been approved for use in severe COVID also as an alternative to dexamethasone, which means when you can't use the common therapies, that time only you can use jackinibs. Likewise, here also these novel therapies will be tried only when you can't use the baseline therapies. Like when you can't use anti of drugs, as an alternative, maybe you can try this novel jackinibs. Please tell side effect of methotrexate. Methotrexate can cause so many side effects. So methotrexate can cause pneumonitis and pulmonary fibrosis. Methotrexate can cause hepatitis and liver cirrhosis. Methotrexate can cause bone marrow suppression. Methotrexate can cause mucositis. Methotrexate is an abortifacient. Methotrexate is teratogenic. Methotrexate is metabolized by the renal, that is kidneys. So there are so many things that we can say about methotrexate and it's a DHFR inhibitor that everyone knows that's going to inhibit something called as dihydrofolate reductase. And it is definitely not safe in pregnancy. But in exams, when we uh, talk about methotrexate side effects, three side effects are very important. Number one, bone marrow suppression. Number two, heterotoxicity, hepatitis and cirrhosis. Number three, pulmonary toxicity, pneumonitis and pulmonary fibrosis. Management of Felty syndrome, just like any other rheumatoid arthritis, you're going to manage Felty syndrome, nothing more than that. Yes, methotrexate is eliminated renally. And top of that, let me tell you another interesting information that methotrexate is dialysable. Methotrexate is dialysable. It's a dialysable drug. Oligospermia by sulfazalazine or leflomid. It is sulfazalazine. Sulfazalazine and methotrexate both can cause reversible male infertility. I'll repeat, 
सल्फेसलाइजिन एंड मेथोट्रेक्सेट कैन कॉज रिवर्सिबल मेल इनफर्टिलिटी ओके सो लीव लीव अलोन सो ऑल द अदर ड्रग्स आर बेसिकली लाइक काइंड ऑफ डी मार्ट्स बट योर नेप्रोक्सिन इज नॉट अ डी मार्ट देर आर सम डी मार्ट्स विच यू डोंट यूज कॉमनली इन प्रैक्टिस डी मार्ट्स विच डोंट यूज कॉमनली इन प्रैक्टिस दैट इज डी पेंसिलम एंड गोल्ड एंड दीज आर द डी मार्ट्स दैट वी डोंट यूज कॉमन इन प्रैक्टिस आई रिपीट डी पेंसिलम एंड गोल्ड एंड देर इज अनदर डी मार्ट कार्ड अजर टाइप्रिन इट्स यूटिलिटी इन रोमेटा दैट इज वेरी वेरी मिनिमल बिकॉज ऑफ वेरियस रीसेंस एंड वी डोंट यूज डी पेंसिलम एंड बिकॉज ऑफ द साइड इफेक्ट्स एंड another one is uh, gold okay this is something that we don't use very often as well so azathioprine yes it's a demand can be used in rheumatoid arthritis but its efficacy is not that great compared to other disease modifying drugs anti al1 anakindra yes i forgot to write but can be used but it's not very commonly used in india right now that's why i don't write that often so i use, usually tend to miss that when teaching the students okay and anti al1 is anakindra and we have two drugs in fact man one is anakindra and second one i don't know who's going to tell the second drug second drug is kenakimumab i don't know how many of you know that this is approved for use in both rheumatoid arthritis as well as in acute gout this is also used in acute gout kenakimumab both drugs can be used in acute gout okay so fine question number 8 is done treatment is very important coming to the next question a patient has a diagnosis of diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis what is dcssc that is diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis presence with malignant hypertension oliguria hemolysis and renal failure which of the following is the recommended treatment so captopril carvedilol clonidin diltiazem i don't think you need to think too much about it even just with a picture just with your common sense just with the assumptions you can make this question correct i don't think this is going to be a tough question at any any i mean at any level so the right answer for this question is option a captopril okay so it's an ac inhibitor so that's going to be the gold standard treatment i don't know why many people are going for carvedilol or clonidine or diltiazem here so uh, what what is this patient suffering from this patient is basically suffering from something called as scleroderma renal crisis that's what this patient is suffering from so it's very common in patients with diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis and the treatment of choice for scleroderma renal crisis is going to be ac inhibitors and i don't know why people are answering clonidine maybe they would have got confused by thinking that uh, uh it's a kind of an ak acute kidney failure so you cannot give ac inhibitors which is an nephrotoxic drug but remember that's true yes what you're thinking is correct we don't use ac inhibitors in the setting of acute kidney injury but trust me uh we have to use ac inhibitor in the setting of scleroderma renal crisis that's extremely important this is one of the rare situations where you can use ac inhibitors even in the setting of severe acute kidney injury so it's very very important okay that's the treatment of choice so everyone would have been knowing the differences between limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis and diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis you know the difference so limited cutaneous will have limited skin involvement which means only distal areas will be involved but uh diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis will involve both distal and proximal areas so if steroids was an option would be choose it over ac inhibitors absolutely not remember steroids are not used in patients with scleroderma in fact usage of high dose steroids are associated with increased risk of scleroderma renal crisis we don't use high dose steroids first of all in scleroderma because of increased risk of from i mean scleroderma renal crisis so steroids are never a treatment option for src it's going to be always your ac inhibitors nothing more than that fine so coming to limited cutaneous type of systemic sclerosis uh, what is otherwise called as the old name for limited cutaneous type of systemic sclerosis is going to be the crest syndrome you know what is crest calcinosis cute is raynaud's phenomenon esophageal dysmotility sclerodactyly and telangiectasia so what is the most important problem here you're going to get more of vascular problems vascular complications what are the vascular complications like telangiectasias okay and you are going to get uh, something like pulmonary artery hypertension so that's what is going to occur but in diffuse cutaneous variety you are going to see more of organ related complications organ damage is more common than vascular damage so what are the evidences of organ damage like patients can develop uh, cardiac involved in the form of restrictive cardiomyopathy rcm stands for restrictive cardiomyopathy and patients can develop pulmonary involvement in the form of ild and patients can develop 
renal involvement in the form of SRC. Okay, so these are going to be the classic manifestations. And what's going to kill you? So it's the pulmonary artery hypertension. That's the usual reason for death in patients with limited kidney variety. What's going to kill you? This is the usual reason for death in patients with diffuse kidney variety. And what are the antibodies that are associated? The most important antibody here is anti-centromeric antibody that is otherwise called as ACA. So what is the most important antibody? It is anti-topoisomerase 1 antibody or otherwise called as anti-SCL7 antibody. SCL70 antibody. This is the antibody that's going to be associated with diffuse kidney variety. And there is another specific antibody that's specific for scleroderma renal crisis that's called as anti-RNA polymerase 3 antibody. So this is a kind of a very specific antibody for diffuse goodness variety of scleroderma. So anti-RNA polymerase 3 antibody. So okay, very specific antibody for scleroderma renal crisis especially. So in that, how will you treat pulmonary artery hypertension? Pulmonary artery hypertension will be treated with vasodilators. Okay, pulmonary artery hypertension will be treated with vasodilators like sildenafil, nifidipin or uh, probably uh, endothelial receptor antagonists like bocentan, ambricentan and so on. So how are you going to treat ILD? ILD will be treated with immunosuppression like cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate morphotil. But in our practice, we prefer mycophenolate morphotil as the first choice. So you're going to give immunosuppression. Scleroderma renal crisis, I told you treatment of choice will be AC inhibitors. So this is the exact presentation of scleroderma renal crisis. Exact presentation. This is how it presents. They are going to present with malignant hypertension, very high BP. They are going to present with acute kidney injury, with oliguria and very high creatinine. And they will have evidence of hemolysis. And most of the times it will be microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Microangiopathic hemolytic anemia in the sense, uh, peripheral smear will show a lot of fragmented RBCs or otherwise called as cystocytes. So this is going to present like that only. So in a diffuse goodness variety of systemic sclerosis, if you develop malignant hypertension, AKI, and if you have evidence of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, please don't uh, try to diagnose anything else apart from scleroderma renal crisis. And the treatment of choice of this condition is going to be AC inhibitors. Somebody is asking about BMPR2 gene in uh, pulmonary hypertension. Yes, some types of primary pulmonary hypertension and familial pulmonary hypertension can have a mutation in the BMPR2 gene that is the bone morphogenic protein receptor 2 gene. That's correct. So that's not something that we're going to discuss here. Coming to question number 10, which of the following conditions is more common in patients with diffuse goodness variety of scleroderma compared to the of limited goodness variety of scleroderma? I, I think I've mentioned this already. So this is an easy one, basically. So we have discussed that just in the previous slide. So why you want to like think at all in the first place? So we know that Crest syndrome, esophageal dysmodity, esophageal involvement is going to be more common with limited goodness variety compared to diffuse goodness. Pulmonary artery hypertension is going to be more common with limited goodness compared to diffuse goodness. Raynaud phenomenon is also going to be more common with uh, limited goodness compared to diffuse goodness. But what is going to be more common with diffuse goodness compared to limited goodness variety is pulmonary fibrosis. Correct pulmonary fibrosis that's going to be more common with diffuse goodness variety because we know diffuse goodness variety is going to produce more of uh, organ involvement so coming to the next one so a patient with primary jogren syndrome notes continued parotid swelling for the last three months with enlarging posterior cervical lymph nodes evaluation shows leukopenia and low complement levels which of the following is the most likely diagnosis I mean, uh, I don't know who have attended. I mean, uh, there are some residents of mine who are also attending the lec attending his lecture. So if any one of you are attending, Dr. Stone is answering with due respect. I haven't got any PDF of previous sessions. I think we have uploading everything in the Telegram. And I, I, I'm, every time I'm getting the same question again and again, like they're asking for the PDF. I, I've al I'm already uploading every single PDF in the Telegram in Dr. Dilip's MS group and in Dr. Zaina Bora's group. So I don't think like uh, you're seeing there. So obviously, yes, some of my residents are attending the lecture. So you should be easily able to say like today we have seen a case like this. So we have uh, a, a 50 year old female who presented with progressive left sided parotid swelling. She noticed a little bit of weight loss and uh, she had started to have the enlarging uh, post auricular and post hospital nodes. Okay. And uh, she started having low C4 level. She also had a little bit of leukopenia in the blood count. It's an exact same case that I saw just today. I mean, we diagnosed it today, but uh, this case came like three, four weeks ago. So 
I framed this question so the right answer is lymphoma. This patient is having a probable parotid gland lymphoma or probably non-Hodgkin lymphoma due to Jogren syndrome. That's what is happening over here. So how does you, I mean, how do you diagnose lymphoma? So whenever the patient is having enlarging lymph nodes, new enlarging lymph nodes. Yes, whenever you have new enlarging lymph nodes with leukopenia and low C4, that's exact statement that is given in Harrison. It's going to be a lymphoma most of the times. And if they ask you Jogren syndrome and cancer, that's a very important question, right? Jogren syndrome and cancer. So what is the most common cancer that's associated with Jogren syndrome? It is extranodal marginal zone lymphoma, otherwise called as maltoma. Okay, malt lymphoma. And the most common location for this cancer is going to be the stomach. Most common location is going to be the stomach. Gastric maltomas, that's going to be the most common when it comes to Jogren syndrome. And most common reason for gastric maltoma will be H. pylori. That's different. But Jogren syndrome is one of the causes of like gastric maltomas. This is the most common cancer. And how will you diagnose Jogren syndrome? It's going to be a triad. This is also a very important exam. So number one, you're going to have positive serology. So what are the serological markers that you have to look for? Two antibodies, ANA. And second is specific antibody, that is anti-SSA, otherwise called as Rho, and anti-SSB, otherwise called as LA antibody. So serology will be positive. Next, you're going to have ocular staining score will be high, like three and above ocular staining score. So this is to prove the dry eyes. This is to prove the dry eyes. So what is the dye that we use right now? We use a dye called as lysamine green and fluorescent. To do the ocular staining score, we, we use dyes like lysamine green and fluorescent. Lysamine green and fluorescent. So to prove the dry eyes. Third part of the triad is going to be your biopsy. Where we do biopsy? We do biopsy from the minor salivary glands. Typically in the lips, in the lip area, minor salivary glands. That you're going to do the biopsy from. No, no, no. Schirmer's test is outdated. Schirmer's test is something that we don't do anymore. It is going to show a lot of false positivity, false negativity, and a lot of gray area. So, but nevertheless, if you want to know what is Schirmer positivity, you have to wait. You have to put a piece of uh, what my number 47 filter paper in the lower palpable conjunctiva. Hook it there and wait for some time and you have to look for the amount of wetness. If it is less than 5, it is definitely dry eyes. More than 15 in 5 minutes, it's okay. Uh, 5 to 15 is a kind of a gray area. So Schirmer test is something that we don't use. Anyways, biopsy. So what do you see in biopsy? You're going to see CD4 infiltrate. That's a very important point. You're going to see something called as CD4 infiltrate in the acinae. Around the minus alveolar gland acinae, you're going to see CD4 infiltrate. So there is another entity called as focus core. I think pathologists would have taught you about that. Uh, so what is a focus? Focus means like collection of 50 lymphocytes in an area. That's called as focus. So technically, according to the pathology people, if you have at least one focus per pore millimeter square of the slide area, at least one focus per four millimeter square of the slide area. So if that is the case, then you can call it as a positive biopsy for Jogren. So out of these three, if you have at least two, then you can probably call it as a Jogren syndrome. So serology, ocular staining score, biopsy. So there are something with regards to silometry also, which is something that will be asked usually in INACT exams. We are not going to talk about that right now. But this case is all about your uh, like lymphoma, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Coming to question number 12, it's actually quite an easy question if you understand uh, the concepts properly. All of the following are effective in treating psoriatic arthritis except. All of the following are effective in treating psoriatic arthritis except. Option A, Adalimumab. Option B, Secukinumab. Option C, Ustekinumab. And option D, Rituximab. So the following is not going to be effective in treating psoriatic arthritis. So what is not effective? So I'm going to give 10 seconds for you guys. Okay, the right answer for this question is going to be option T, rituximab. Rituximab is something that's not going to be effective in treating psoriatic arthritis. It's not just ineffective for psoriatic arthritis. For any seronegative spondylarthropathy, rituximab is not effective. Rituximab cannot be used 
in any seronegative spondyloarthropathies because in seronegative spondyloarthropathies the pathophysiology is not antibodies so remember when you talk about zero negative spinal arthropathies so the name itself such as zero negative spinal arthropathies means they are not going to have any antibodies if you don't have antibodies how can you use a drug that's going to reduce the production of antibodies like rituximab rituximab is anti cd20 it's going to block and kill the b lymphocytes which are the ones that are going to produce antibodies in the future in the form of differentiating into plasma cells so you can't use that okay so that's not going to be effective in any zero negative spinal arthropathies rather it can be used in zero positive conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or probably even in sle is going to be useful in many situations but definitely not in um zero negative spinal arthropathies like psoriatic arthritis so what about other three drugs other three drugs are very useful like adalimumab is going to be an anti dnf drug which can be used sacuquinumab is like anti il17 receptor inhibitor that also can be used to stake in map is a combined anti il12 and il23 inhibitor which is also approved to be used in patients with many seronegative spinal arthropathies including psoriatic arthritis and one new drug that's been approved for use in psoriatic arthritis phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor that's called as apramilast okay aprami last a p r e m i l a s t that's called as apramilast it's a novel new phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor that's been approved to be used in patients with psoriatic arthritis okay fine So all these drugs are approved except rituximab, not effective in seronegative spinal arthropathies. So question number thirteen, which of the following features are not typically seen in a patient with AOST? What is AOST? It's called as adult onset Stills disease. I'll repeat, it's called as adult onset Stills disease. Macrolides rash, rheumatoid factor pyrexia, high ferritin level. So first, let me tell you how will you diagnose adult onset Stills disease. So first of all, the age group is very very important. So 16 to 35. So if the age group is less than 16, it will be called as um, something else. So that will be a juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So that's different. So that's also called as Stills disease. But age should be more than 16. Then only can called as adult onset Stills disease. Point number one. Second. So remember this. is a condition that's going to mimic rheumatoid arthritis in many situations the patient will have fever many times they can have present like a po so they can just present with fever 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 and fever will be typically a bicotidian fever in the sense like they will be having uh, two spikes a day that's very characteristic and sometimes it can mimic a typhoid also so patients are going to present with fever that's the primary manifestation and patients will have rash this is also called as salmon rash especially in the trunk they can have salmon kind of rash in the trunk and patients will have arthritis or at least arthralgia and patients can have hepatosplenomegaly patient will have elevated total leukocyte count and patient will have elevated crp and very 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 high ferritin sometimes many times they are going to have very high ferritin but what is not seen it's zero negative rheumatoid factor will be negative Anti CCP will be negative, and even ANA will be negative. So this is zero negative. This is not something that's going to have zero positivity. Treatment will be very similar to that of rheumatoid arthritis, but anti AL1 therapies are going to be very very effective in AOSD because the entire spectrum of AOSD is mediated by IL1 interleukin one. So fever, salmon rash, arthritis, in the absence of infection, you have ruled out all the infectious etiologies. It's not infection. You can empirically make a diagnosis of. adult onset stills disease and the criteria that is used to diagnose aosd is called as yamaguchi criteria yamaguchi's criteria the criteria that's used for diagnosing adult onset stills disease is yamaguchi criteria so maplapapla rash fine pyrexia fine high ferritin level fine rheumatoid factor no that's the right answer because this is something that's not seen in patients with adult onset stills disease coming to question number 14 so you have a stale potato curry causes severe gastroenteritis in a picnic group this is also one of my own patients only so 36 year old man recovers from the diarrhea but two weeks later he develops arthritis in his right knee and severe left sided achilles tendonitis what is the most or likely organism that's going to be implicated over here it's campylobacter jejuni shigella flexneri h pylori or clostridium difficile so which is going to be the most common organism that's going to be implicated so you know the diagnosis here right so patient had a like gastrointestinal illness and following gastrointestinal illness he is developed uh, arthritis and he has developed 
tendinitis. Arthritis and he has developed tendinitis. Tendinitis. Okay. So technically we are talking about reactive arthritis. Otherwise called as Rita syndrome. So what is the most common organism implicated? It is Shigella flexneri. Shigella group is the one that's most commonly implicated. Camperbach jejuni could be implicated but that's not very common. Shigella shigellae and Shigella flexneri are the ones that are most commonly implicated in the setting of uh, GA infection causing reactive arthritis. You know what is reactive arthritis? It need not be a GA infection alone. It could be a STD also. It could be a sexually transmitted disease also. If you talk about STD causing reactive arthritis, most often it will be chlamydia. If you talk about GA infection causing reactive arthritis, it will be very commonly a shigella. Shigella flexneri or shigella, shigella. And what will be the typical triad of Rita syndrome? Apart from arthritis, patients will have urethritis and patients will have conjunctivitis and patients can have associated skin involvement as well. You know what is reactive arthritis? It can't pee, can't see, can't climb battery. Why can't see conjunctivitis? Why can't pee urethritis? Why can't climb battery? Because of arthritis and tendinitis. So skin involvement, you know what are the classic lesions? I'm not going to tell again and again. You know very well it is keratoderma blenergicum which are hyperpigmented rashes in the palms and the sole hyperpigmented hyperkeratotic rashes in the palms and soles that is keratoderma blenergicum and we have circinate balnitis which is nothing but inflammation of the glands penis okay inflammation of the glands penis that is circinate balnitis i'll repeat circinate balnitis and reactive arthritis is a kind of a self-limiting disease within 12 months most of the cases will resolve automatically but till that time you may need to give immunosuppression like NSAIDs probably steroids or even anti-TNF drugs but it's only going to be there for a short term and more importantly uh, reactive arthritis should be treated with doxycycline three to six months of doxy is mandatory because this is usually due to some underlying infection so technically most of the guidelines incorporate doxycycline also for three to six months along with whatever treatment you give okay Coming to 15th question, which of the following is required for the diagnosis of Bechet syndrome? Uveitis, pathogy, recurrent oral ulceration, recurrent genital ulceration. I'm asking which of the following is required for the diagnosis of Bechet. Okay, let me tell the answer. The right answer is option C, that is recurrent oral ulceration. That's required for the diagnosis of Bechet. So what are the international concerns created? Because Bechet doesn't have any antibodies, trust me. You cannot diagnose this with antibodies. You cannot diagnose with the HLA molecule. It cannot be diagnosed with anything else. It's all clinical, completely clinical when it comes to Bechet. So what are the essential criteria? The recurrent oral aphthous ulceration. It is mandatory. This is mandatory. Or else it is a must. Plus, you have other four features, totally five. In that four, if you have any two, you can make a diagnosis of Bechet. So, in that, we have the recurrent genital ulceration, okay, recurrent genital aphthous ulceration, and you have eye lesions also. The typical eye lesions in Bechet will be uveitis. Very commonly, they will ask you. And in that, post uveitis or antiuveitis which is more important the post uveitis causing hypopoyan is more important than antiuveitis so post uveitis that's going to be more important it's going to be more common than antiuveitis and this can result in hypopoyan formation in exam you see a vasculitis with hypopoyan right answer is beshe that's it nothing more than that that's a very stereotypical question and skin lesions skin lesions are very common and the most common skin lesion is going to be erythema nodosum or it can have pseudo folliculitis papillopustular lesions, acneiform lesions, so many, but they will ask you this. Most common is going to be erythema nodosum. And patients will have positive pathology. Okay, some patients can have positive pathology. So what is positive pathology? Going to do a small pinprick in that area, going to develop nodules, ulcers, and even pustules. Okay, so that's going to be what we call it as positive pathology. So out of these four, if you have any two, along with oral ulcers, it is beshe. So what is required is going to be recurrent oral ulceration. This is something that is definitely needed for the diagnosis. Without that, you will not be able to diagnose. Others are optional. Others are also based basically criteria for diagnosis of Bechet only, but they are optional. Your uh, recurrent oral ulcers are required for diagnosis. 
Yeah, yeah. So many people are commenting B5, yes. Um, Beshe is associated with HLA called as HLA B5 or in exam you can get B51 also. It's more common in Ascanazi juice. In India, you can see some sporadic cases, of course, yes. Treatment is just like any other autoimmune disorder going to treat with immunosuppression, nothing more than that. It's a multi-vessel vasculitis. It can affect vessels of any sizes, need not be large, medium and small. And some people are commenting painful genitals. These are after ulcers, man. Everyone would have got after ulcers in your life. It's going to be excruciatingly painful. Any after ulcer for that matter is going to be very, very painful. Everyone knows that. So coming to question number 16. So a patient with history of MI complained of shoulder and thigh pain while on statins. Statins were discontinued since the CPK was elevated to 8 times the upper limit of normal. Statins were discontinued since the CPK was elevated. But patient's pain continued and CPK is now 12 times the upper limit of normal. So initially they thought it's due to statins. They stopped statins but CPK continued to elevate to 12 times the upper limit of normal. What is the next best test to establish the diagnosis? Option A, anti-HMG coireductase antibody. Second, ANA. Third, uh, anti jovan antibody. Fourth, anti-SRP antibody. This is a kind of a very tricky question. This is a, a question that I purposefully made it tough. So some people are answering it correctly. Some people are answering it as option number C. Uh, technically, here you're dealing with something else. Okay, the right answer for this question is option A. That is anti-HMG coireductase antibody again given in Harrison straight forward from Harrison. So what about anti joan antibody? anti joan antibody will be associated with something called as synthetase syndrome. anti joan antibody will be associated with something called as synthetase syndrome. Synthetase syndrome. So what do you mean by the term synthetase syndrome? Patients will have myositis, typically a polymyositis picture. Typically a polymyositis picture. Number two, patients will be having Raynaud's phenomenon. Patients can have fever and arthritis. Patients can have fever and arthritis. And number four, patients can have interstitial lung disease, ILD. And my God, yeah, interstitial lung disease. And patients find last but not least they can have something called as mechanics hands. Mechanics hands. You all know what is that mechanics hands. So these are the manifestations of anti joan or any synthetase antibody for that matters. Anti joan is an example of a synthetase antibody. Likewise, you have plenty of other antibodies. And what about anti SRP? Anti SRP is going to be assessed with something called as necrodicing autoimmune myositis. I'll talk about that in a while. That's called as NAM, necrodicing autoimmune myopathy, necrodicing autoimmune myopathy. Anti-HMG coireductase antibody is also going to be assessed with something called as necrodicing autoimmune myopathy or necrodicing autoimmune myositis. So why I have not talked about anti-SRP then? Both can cause necrodicing autoimmune. So anti-HMG coireductase antibody is the one that's going to have association with statin use. This is the one that's going to have association with statin use technically. And anti-SRP antibodies has no association. See, anti-signal recognition particle has no association with statin use. And second, apart from that, it will have severe cardiac involvement. That's why this is an antibody that's going to have poor prognosis. Cardiac involvement is very, very common with anti-SRP antibody. So that's why the right answer for this question is anti-HMG coreductase antibody. So let me uh, tell you the four important entities. So point number one is going to, I mean, first is going to be the polymyositis, second dermatomyositis, third we have something called sporadic inclusion body myositis, and fourth we have necrodicing autoimmune myopathy. I will differentiate each and everything. First of all, my question for you will be whether pain will be there in these myositis or pain will not be there. The muscle will be tender or muscle will not be tender. Pain will be there or pain will not be there in these patients. That's my question to you all. In idiopathic inflammatory myositis. So first of all, remember patients can have myalgia, but significant pain is never a feature of idiopathic inflammatory myositis. That many people don't understand. That's a very important point. If you have significant muscle pain and significant muscle tenderness, it's unlikely to be idiopathic inflammatory myositis. They don't have significant pain and tenderness. Very, very important point. Okay, if you have significant pain or tenderness, you have to think about something else apart from idiopathic inflammatory myositis. Okay, fine. All right. So now what about, I mean, how they present then? They don't have 
pain, but rather they will have weakness. And they are going to present with elevated CRP. That's how they present. So polymyositis, typically they are going to present with weakness. So dermatomyositis, weakness plus skin rash, but even though skin rash is going to be the most important. Sporadic inclusion body myositis, they will be weak. Okay, that's the most important thing. They don't have any skin rash, but remember that this weakness is due to myopathy, right? This weakness is due to myopathy. But sporadic inclusion body myositis is one disorder where weakness is going to be due to both myo and neuropathy. That's a very, very important point. Okay, so neuropathy is associated with sporadic inclusion body myositis. It's not only associated with myopathy, it's also associated with neuropathy. That's very, very important. Okay, among all the myositis, that's the one that's going to cause neuropathy. And what about the age? Age will be 30s and 40s. For both 30s and 40s. In both. But in sporadic inclusion body myositis, age is going to be more than 50. Elderly people, typically elderly men will be affected. Okay. But whereas most of the dermato and polymyositis patients will be females. But sporadic inclusion body myositis will be males. Elderly males. Okay. So what about the weakness? The weakness will be proximal weakness. Weakness will be proximal weakness in polymyositis. Even in dermatomyositis, you have proximal weakness. But in sporadic inclusion body myositis, you are going to have proximal and distal weakness both together. Proximal and distal weakness. That is why this is even more relevant. So there are a lot of specialties with regards to sporadic inclusion body myositis. That's why you have to remember for exam that sporadic inclusion body myositis is special. It has so many additional features. Associated neuropathy, proximal and distal weakness both. Elderly patients, males more than 50 years, sporadic inclusion body myositis. Okay, whether it responds to immunosuppression or not, it doesn't respond to immunosuppression, sporadic inclusion body myositis. Immunosuppression shows a response. Steroids will show some response. Immunosuppression shows response in dermatomyositis, but there is absolutely no response to immunosuppression. It's very, very difficult and challenging to treat sporadic inclusion body myositis. It's not easy because they don't show much response to immunosuppression. So that's it. This is what you need to know. Okay, very important for exams. And what about CPK? CPK levels will be elevated, but uh, technically more than uh, 50 times the upper limit of normal. So it will be very much elevated. CPK levels will be very much elevated in dermatomyositis also. But CPK levels will be normal or only mildly elevated in the setting of sporadic inclusion body myositis. It will be less than 10 times the upper limit of normal. Not be that much elevated. So these are the three important types of Myositis. Apart from that, there are new emerging category called as necrotizing autoimmune myopathy. Here, you will see more of necrosis, less of inflammation. You won't see more of inflammation, rather you will see less of inflammation and you will see more macrophage infiltration. Macrophage infiltration. You know, in the routine idiopathic inflammatory myositis that we have discussed, in these disorders, you will see a lot of lymphocytes. Okay, That's what is characteristic because it's inflammation, lymphocytes. But in necrotizing autoimmune myopathy, you're going to see more of macrophage infiltration, less of inflammatory cells, more of necrosis. That's characteristic. That's why we are grouping this disorder separately. And there are two antibodies that are associated. In fact, three antibodies are there. And the most important is anti-SRP antibody that can cause NAM. Second is anti-HMG CoA reductase antibody. HMG CoA reductase antibody. Third one is going to be anti um 200 bar 100 antibody, anti 200 bar 100 antibody. These are three antibodies that are related to necrotizing autoimmune myopathy. In that HMG coreductase antibody and 200 bar 100 antibody is associated with statin use. Is associated with statin use. In that current evidence says that 200 bar 100 is more related to statin use, more related to statin use compared to the top HMG coreductase antibodies. Okay, this is NAM and again CPK elevation will not be that great. CT CPK will only will be mildly elevated, mild to moderate elevation. You won't see that much elevation of CPK in necrotizing autoimmune myopathy. Clear? So that's what is going to occur. So these are three antibodies. So now you can say that we are talking about statin related necrotizing, necrotizing autoimmune myopathy and that's why I'm going to mark anti-HMG correctus antibody and not other options. 
And you know the most important antibody that you need to know for exams with regards to polymyositis is anti jovan antibody. That's what you know for exam. The most important antibody for dermatomyositis is going to be anti MI2 antibody. So which is going to be acid with Charlesine, Venexine, and all. That's the two antibodies that you need to know. But please remember these three antibodies as well: anti SRP, anti HMG colorectase, and anti 200 bar 100 antibodies. Okay, going to the next question. So you have 17 question. All of the following conditions are manifestations of IgG4 related disease except autoimmune pancreatitis, crescentic glomerulonephritis, lymphoplasmacytic iotitis, orbital pseudo pseudotumor. So which of the following is not going to be a manifestation of IgG4 related disease? Everyone knows that IgG4 related disease has become a very important disease nowadays. It could be asked in exam. Pathologists definitely would have taught you this. And it's going to have... Three features in the histology. Biopsy is the gold stand for diagnosis. What are the three features in the histology? So number one, you're going to have obliterative phlebitis. Obliterative phlebitis. Number two, you're going to have storiform fibrosis. Storiform fibrosis. Number three, you're going to have IgG4 secreting lymphoplasma cytoid cells. IgG4 secreting lymphoplasma cytoid cells in biopsy. So this is characteristic of IgG4 related disease. In pathology, they're definitely taught you. And IgG4 disease can produce many problems, like they can cause pituitary problem, pituitary infiltration. They can produce. Uh, uh, parotid problems similar to that of Jogren syndrome. They can produce Riddle's thyroiditis like picture. I mean, previously we thought it's Riddle's thyroiditis, but we know very sure it's not Riddle's thyroiditis anymore. It just produced Riddle's thyroiditis like picture. Okay, then they can produce mediastinal fibrosis. They can produce uh, a certain subset of retroperitoneal fibrosis. They can produce autoimmune pancreatitis. So, what is in autoimmune pancreatitis? You're going to see typically a sausage shaped pancreas. Everyone knows that, right? Sausage shaped pancreas. If they give you this in exam, it is autoimmune pancreatitis or IgG4 related pancreatitis. Sausage shaped pancreas. Lymphoplasmacytic iatritis, definitely yes. They can produce iatritis also. They can produce orbital pseudotumor. They can produce retroperitoneal fibrosis. They can produce thyroid gland problem like Riddle's thyroiditis. They can produce parotid gland involvement and they can produce Zika syndrome. Okay, so gland, they can produce plenty of things, but they don't produce crescentic glomerulonephritis. It's not associated with crescentic glomerulonephritis. Rather, what is the kidney manifestation of IgG4 related global, related disease? Acute interstitial nephritis. This is the kidney manifestation of IgG4 related disease, not crescentic glomerulonephritis. It's not going to produce RPG or crescentic glomerulonephritis. Rather, they produce acute interstitial nephritis. But it can produce kidney injury by causing retroperitoneal fibrosis. Once you develop retroperitoneal fibrosis, the ureters can become obstructed and that can result in increased pressure in the kidneys and that can cause obstructive AKI or postrenal AKI. That's possible. But direct kidney problem is something that's going to occur through AN, that is acute interstitial nephritis, not crescentic glomal nephritis. That's wrong. RPG is not a feature. Crescentic glomal nephritis is not a feature. Now going to the question 18. All of the following treatment are efficacious in treating osteoarthritis symptoms except again totally Harrison based parastomol, glucocorticoid, intraarticular injections, glucosamine, chondroitin, naproxen. So it's an orthopedics overlap question so I'm not going to discuss too much about this. The right answer is glucosamine, chondroitin injections or glucosamine, chondroitin tablets or whatever it is. This is not at all beneficial, not to be used, high cost, not effective. So astomenophen, yes, one of the main treatments as far as your uh, osteoarthritis is concerned. As the first line treatment of choice for many patients with osteoarthritis, intraarticular glucocorticoid injections also can be used in selected patients, especially for knee joint osteoarthritis and all, and hip joint osteoarthritis, you can try for some time. So it will give a transient relief, and the relief will be like unexpected. Some people may respond, some people may not respond, but you can try. Naproxen, yes, definitely you can try. Even opioid drugs can be tried or topical um, castasin ointment can be tried. But what is not should uh, to be tried is glucosamine chondroitin injection, which is not at all going to be beneficial. So 19th question, which of the following statements is incorrect with regards to use of allopurinol in gout? 
Aliprinol should not be used with colchicine. Aliprinol dosing should be adjusted for renal function. Aliprinol should be titrated to maintain a serum uric acid of less than 6. Aliprinol hypersensitivity is going to assert with something called as HLA-B5801. Which of the following is incorrect? That's what I'm asking. So what is the wrong statement? I'll give you 15 to 20 seconds time. You're going to answer. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. The right answer for this is option A. Aloprinol should not be used with colchicine. That's wrong. See, aloprinol should not be used with azathioprine. Should not be used with azathioprine. That's correct. Okay, that's a correct statement. But aloprinol can, can be used with colchicine. No problem at all. This is a very, very important point, in fact. You cannot give aloprinol and azathioprine together because many rheumatological disorders uh, will be treated with azathioprine and patients can have hyperuricemia and you cannot treat that with uh, aloprinol. You have to give something else. So because xanthine oxidase inhibition can result in uh, like increased levels of azathioprine and that can result in azathioprine toxicity. That's why don't mix azathioprine and aloprinol. But you can give aloprinol with colchicin. No problem at all. In fact, for many patients, we continue colchicin for a long period of time to prevent recurrent attacks of gout. So if they ask you how will you treat acute attack of gout, acute gout, how will you treat? Number one, you are going to give NSH. These are the first line preferred drugs. Second drug is colchicin. Third drug is corticosteroids. And we have anti-IL-1 therapies also like anakindra and kenakimumab. Anakindra and kenakimumab. Anakindra and Kenakumab, these also can be treated. Even Trilonacept is there, but uh, these are drugs that we very commonly use in practice for acute attack of gout. So, chronic gout, chronic maintenance therapy, you have to give uric acid lowering therapy. So, what are the drugs that reduces the uric acid that is commonly used? One is allopurinol, second is febuxostat, febuxostat. So, what are these drugs? Both are basically xanthine oxidase inhibitors. Both are basically xanthine oxidase inhibitor. Allopurinol is a competitive inhibitor. Febuxostat is a non-competitive inhibitor. That's the only difference. Febuxostat is going to bind to a different site. It's a non-competitive inhibition. That's all. Allopurinol is a pure analog. By based on that, it's going to bind with the uh, xanthine oxidase enzyme. And we have uricosuric drugs which are not at all effective. What are the uricosuric drugs? We have uh, probenecid, we have benzbromerone, we have lecinurad. These are drugs that we don't use in practice that often, not very effective drugs. And the third option is pegloticase. Pegloticase. This is used for chronic tophaceous gout. So remember, uh, pegloticase is a recombinant uricase. Rasburicase is not approved for use in gout. Rasburicase is only for tumor lysis syndrome. Pegloticase should not be used in tumor lysis syndrome, by the way. Pegloticase is only for gout. So these drugs are approved in selected situations. Pegloticase for gout, rasburicase for tumor lysis syndrome. Don't mix together. Both are different. It's a recombinant uricase. And uh, one point that they may be asking you in exam is these recombinant uricase enzymes are absolutely contraindicated in G6 period efficiency. In G6 period efficiency, you should not use these enzymes. Pegloticase as well as rasburicase. Both are contraindicated in G6PD deficiency. So, so in chronic tophaceous gout, these are the options. In acute gout, these are going to be the options. Many times what we do is, in acute gout, don't start allopurinol. That's very important. Don't start xanthine oxidase inhibition. That's a very important point. Don't start drugs that lower the uric acid. The most common drug that we use is allopurinol. So don't start the drug in acute gout because it can increase the risk of flares. It can flare up the acute gout. That's why, because of a lot of reasons. So that's something that can be asked in exams. Don't start if it's an acute gout. If the patient is already taking allopurinol, you can continue. That's not a problem. If I'm already taking allopurinol and I'm getting an acute gout, just continue. But don't start for the first time if the patient is presenting with acute gout. Very, very important point. Allopurinol dosing should be adjusted to renal function. That's absolutely correct because it's metabolized by the kidneys. You have to adjust the dose accordingly. Allopurinol dosing should be tied to a uric acid of less than 6. That's the target uric acid. That's correct. 
for any uric acid lowering therapy the target uric acid is less than 6 in the serum and allopurinol hypersensitivity is associated with HLA B5801 that's correct that's absolutely correct there are three things that you need to know one is abacavir hypersensitivity HIV drug abacavir that's associated with HLA B5701 and we have allopurinol that's HLA B5801 and we have carmazepin that is HLA P1503. So these three HLAs are very important for exams. B5701 for abacavir, 5801 for allopurinol, and 1503 for carmazepin. So this is a correct statement. So only thing that's wrong is basically option A. I mean, if it's azathioprine, option would have been correct, but it's colgis and it's wrong. Colgis and allopurinol can be used together. In many patients, we do use both together. Last question, all of the following therapies are recommended as a part of treatment plan for fibromyalgia except. So is it exercise and yoga, is it uh, milnaciprin, is it opioid analgesics or is it pregabalin? So which of the following is not going to be uh, used in patients with fibromyalgia. So you know how to diagnose fibromyalgia in exam, it's pretty much simple and straightforward. It's a functional problem, so there will be no organic issue, which means there should not be any obvious signs except the tender points. So tender points will be positive in different areas of the body and along with that you should not have any heart signs, no rash, no arthritis, okay, patient should not have arthritis, patient should not have rash, uh, patient should not have uh, any dysfunction of any organs, okay, like renal injury, kidney injury, should not have, patient should not have fever, okay, patient should not have any organ injury and CRP should be negative, ESR should be normal antibodies should be negative as well then only you can make a diagnosis of fibromyalgia so it's a functional problem everything should be all right so which means patient will be telling severe pain but apart from that everything else is fine no rash no arthritis no fever no organ damage everything is fine crp normal esr normal antibodies negative even endocrine issues are not there so then you can diagnose fibromyalgia so exercise and yoga are thought to be okay milna cyprin uh, has been thought to be okay as well. So pregabalin also has been approved for treatment in fibromyalgia. The only thing that is something that should not be used is opioid analgesics because it increases the problem. It worsens the problem. It's been proved that opioid analgesics can worsen the problem because of their differential modulating ability in the brain through mu and kappa receptors. They can worsen the pain in patients with fibromyalgia. Please don't use opioid analgesics. Very, very important point. Okay, no opioid analgesics wasn't the issue. So fibromyalgia is another important uh, area for your exams. The treatment of fibromyalgia is something that can be asked in exams as well. Okay. Now moving on to gastroenterology. I have 20 questions for you because I know that uh, gastroenterology is a kind of a topic that will be discussed in surgery and pathology also. So let us quickly brush it off the topic like which of the following is not a risk factor for peptic ulcer disease. First question. So let us finish it off quickly with another one now. So first, eating spicy foods, B, smoking, C, zollinger lesson syndrome, and D, infection with helicobacter pylori. Dr. Topgrass is telling that feeling depressed every time I have repeated four times, please guide. So first, believe in yourself and don't think of anything else right now because like this is the time where you are going to commonly be depressed, I agree, but please don't uh, think of anything else that's only going to distract you so right now what you need to know is like all, all you have to do is stay focused and nothing else at all just be focused just prepare irrespective of the results your preparation is what is going to matter try your best so we'll talk about the results later on maybe we'll analyze discuss the results dissect the results maybe later but i i don't think right now it's time to like uh, getting uh, get to get depressed or uh, to think of anything else apart from like your exam which is going to be on march 5. So many people are answering B, C, A, but the right answer is option A, eating spicy foods. That's right. So there is no study that has demonstrated, this is given in Harrison, there is no study that has demonstrated that eating spicy food is a risk factor for peptic ulcer disease. Be very clear about that. Okay. So we, be, we people believe that uh, eating spicy food is going to increase risk of peptic ulcer disease, but it's not. So there are only two important causes of peptic ulcer disease in the entire world. 
90 percent plus times you're going to have peptic ulcer disease only to due to two reasons reason number one is h pylori reason number two is nsaids that's it there are plenty of other reasons smoking is there alcoholism is there okay zolling relation syndrome is there there are so many okay reasons for development of uh, peptic ulcer disease but these two reasons alone contribute to more than 90 percent of the case of peptic ulcer disease in the community in that in the elderly population especially nsh is a very very important culprit in elderly individuals okay so smoking definitely yes zollinger syndrome surely yes infection with h pylori yes okay so everything is a risk factor for peptic ulcer disease but not eating spicy food But the advice not to eat spicy food first, that's wrong. I don't do that. I don't do it in my practice. Have you seen uh, like any advanced practitioner, especially who are practicing gastroenterology, telling them not to eat spicy food? I don't think so. They won't say that because it's very clear. Eating spicy food is not associated with increased copeptic ulcer disease. That's for sure. There's no doubt about that. One second. Okay. All right. Cool. First advice of peptic ulcer disease. I mean, I'm not going to tell like don't eat uh, spicy food. That's not the advice I'm going to. Not even a relative risk factor. See, risk factors are very simple. Two, H. pylori and NSAIDs, including aspirin. So smoking, alcohol, even stress has been thought to be a risk factor. And uh, presence of autoimmune, I mean, uh, inflammatory problems like Crohn's disease, because Crohn's disease is something that can affect from mouth to the anus, right? Crohn's disease, certain viral infections like cytomegalovirus, herpes simplex virus, and uh, bisphosphonates has been thought to be a risk because they can produce pill-induced esophagitis and sometimes they can cause ulcers also. Zollinger relation syndrome can produce. And conditions like even myeloproliferative disorders, like, you know, like polycythemia vera has been thought to be a risk factor for peptic ulcer disease. Why polycythemia vera? Because the RBCs, uh, the abnormal RBCs in this uh, sense, like they're going to activate mast cells and they can trigger histamine release. I histamine is a risk factor for development of more acid secretion. So peptic ulcer disease, even in the setting of uh, polycythemia vera. Okay, that's because of abnormal mast cells, aberrant mast cells producing more histamine, correct. And apart from that, systemic mastocytosis, you know, mastocytosis, more abnormal mast cells, more histamine, peptic ulcer, and hypercalcemia. Okay, hypercalcemia that can also trigger histamine disease. So hypercalcemia also can result in the development of peptic ulcer disease because hypercalcemia more histamine, more calcium, more histamine. That's the reason. And steroids, what about steroids? Steroids is also kind of a risk factor, honestly. But steroids alone is never a risk factor. For example, if I'm taking steroids alone, it's never a risk factor. When I'm taking with something else, for example, I'm taking steroids. On top of that, I'm taking NSAIDs, risk is very high. If I'm having underlying H. pylori infection, risk is going to be very high. But steroids alone is not a very significant risk factor. But definitely not eating spicy food. Yes, mastocytosis. So what I already told, smoking, alcohol, stress, Crohn's disease, viral infections, steroids, bisphosphonates, zolling relation syndrome, myeloproliferative disorders like polycythemia vera, systemic mastocytosis. Okay, even gastric cancer is a risk factor for peptic ulcer disease. But definitely not eating spicy foods okay cool let us move on to the next question so it's a simple one but i don't know why many of you got it wrong so which of the following is regarded i mean which are the following regarding non-invasive testing of h pylori is true option a there is no reliable non-invasive method to detect h pylori false negative urease breath test reports occur with uh, use of nsaids uh, serology offers the greatest uh, sensitivity for diagnosis of infection and exposure to low dose radiation is a limitation of urease breath test. I mean, again, every single statement is based on Harrison, nothing more than that. Completely Harrison based, okay? So, what is the right answer? No reliable non invasive method to detect H. pylori, false negative urease breath test occur in the use of NSAIDs. Serology offers the greatest sensitivity for the diagnosis of infection. Exposure to low dose radiation is a limitation of urease breath test.
10 seconds for you guys. The right answer for this question is option D. That's correct. Exposure low dose radiation is a limitation to urease breath test. That's correct. Okay. So what about option A? There is no reliable invasive method data. It's probably wrong. We have many reliable methods. I'll talk about that in a while. False negative urease breath test reports occur with the use of NSAIDs is wrong. Rather, it occurs with the use of PPAs and bismuth. Okay. If you are using PPAs and bismuth, false negative urease breath test reports can occur. So PPIs and bismuth, but not with NSAIDs. That's wrong. Serology offers the greatest sensitivity for the diagnosis of infection. Wrong. There are many other like uh, better testing. So this is a very common area that is tested in exam. There are two ways to test for H. pylori. One is invasive testing and second is non-invasive testing. Invasive testing and second is going to be non-invasive testing. Two ways of testing H. pylori. So invasively, how can test? You can do an endoscopy. You're going to take a biopsy. In the biopsy sample, you can do something called as RUT. That's called rapid urease test. This is the one that's very, very commonly performed by many gastroenterologists in India right now. Second, you can send the sample for histology to detect H. pylori, where in histology you're going to do the classic uh, Warthin starry silver stain. You would have studied in pathology, but uh, in reality, we don't use the stain. Rather, we just stain with simple H. &E. But okay, in pathology, you have taught you that Warthin starry silver stain. And then culture sensitivity can be done, but nobody prefers that. It's the only thing that's commonly done in the setting of uh, endoscopy and biopsy is the rapid urease test. So what is the sensitivity and specificity of rapid urease test? Sensitivity is around uh, 80 to 95 percentage and specificity is approximately around 95 to 100 percentage, which means it's almost 100 percent specific in certain situations. Okay, but what about non-invasive testing? Non-invasive testing can be in the form of serology or non-invasive testing could be in the form of urease breath test that's called as UBT where you are allowed to drink a portion of water containing C14 urea and the, I mean C14 compound and that is going to result in formation of uh, urea and that can be detected in the breath with the help of C14 testing. So what is used here is C14. Okay, what is used here is carbon-14. Carbon-14 can emit some radiation so technically this is one small problem that patients can question you when you're doing a urea breath test because it uses c14 there could be some element of radiation that's associated with this test and the third one is going to be the stool antigen test that is stool antigen test so what are the sensitivities and specificities serology has a sensitivity of more than 80 percentage and has a specificity of more than 90 percentage and urea breath test has a sensitivity of more than 90 and specificity of more than 90 as well and stool antigen test also has a sensitivity of more than 90 and specificity of more than 90 that's what is given in Harrison exactly so what they have mentioned is serology offer the greatest sensitivity for diagnosis of infection option is wrong because serology in fact has very very poor sensitivity compared to any other testing you can see that sensitivity of all the other tests is actually quite high compared to that of serology and another important point that you need to know is serology cannot be used to diagnose uh, cure okay so it is it cannot be used as a test of cure it cannot be used as a test of cure test of cure that's a very important point i think every one of you will be knowing this it cannot be used as a test of cure okay so exposure low dose radiation is limitation of urease breath test that's a correct statement so there are many reliable in non-invasive methods okay we know that false negative ubt occurs in the setting of ppas and bismuth use and not nsaid use Serology offers the greatest sensitivity for the diagnosis of infection. No, in fact, it's one of the least sensitive investigations and serology cannot be used as a test of cure. You have to document cure and serology can't be used in that regards. And expert low dose radiation is correct. So UBT uses C14, so it does have a low dose expo uh, exposure to radiation. Before going to the next question, so can you tell the treatment of H. pylori? Treatment. You're going to use quadruple therapy or Mm, triple therapy what is preferred as of now so what kind of therapy are going to prefer it's a quadruple therapy or triple therapy i'm 
waiting for your answers. Quadruple or triple therapy. So what do you think is supposed to be done? Yes, currently we prefer quadruple therapy. Even though many gastroenterologists prefer triple therapy, but what you need to do is follow quadruple therapy. So what are the options for quadruple therapy? You have two options basically. So one is penicillin based option, second is non-beta-lactam based option. So metronidazole is something that's going to be a standard for all these things and PPA is something that will be used in all the regimes. Plus, if the patient is not penicillin allergic, not penicillin allergic then you can use amoxicillin and clarithromycin, which is a macrolid, amoxicillin and clarithromycin, a macrolid. If you don't, if the patient is having penicillin allergy or uh, beta-lactam allergy, then in that situation, alternative to amoxicillin and clarithromycin combination will be a tetracycline and a bismuth combination. Tetracycline and a bismuth. Okay, so this is the regime that we follow. So metronidazole and PPI will be a standard. All patients will receive metronidazole and a PPI, proton pump inhibitor. On top of that, if the patient is not allergic to penicillin, then use amoxicillin clarithromycin. If the patient is allergic to penicillin, then you are going to go for tetracycline and bismuth. Okay, so when you have to do the test of cure, so how long you will give? Typically, you are going to use this treatment for 14 days. That's also an exam question. And when to do the test of cure? You have to document cure. So you have to do some test of cure also. Once you have treated, completed the therapy. So when you have to do the test of cure? Four weeks after completion of treatment. Four weeks after completion, not from the beginning. Four weeks after completion. Four weeks after completion of treatment. Okay. And patient should be off PPAs for one to two weeks. Patient should be off PPAs for one to two weeks. Why this point is important? Because we have already discussed that some tests like urea spread test can become falsely negative if the patient is already using PPAs. That can become falsely negative. That's the reason why you have to make sure that the patient is off PPAs for at least one to two weeks and then you have to document cure. So what test can be used? You can use rapid urea test, you can use urea breath test or you can use stool antigen test also but definitely not serology. Please don't use serology, no serology, no serology, no serology, okay, for documenting cure. It's, it cannot be a test of cure. Okay. Coming to the third question, so what of the, all of the following are treatment options for IBS of diarrheal type except, so procolopride, allocetron, lopramide, cholestromine, so which of the following is not basically a treatment option for IBST. So waiting for your answers as usual. Yes, option is, I mean answer is option A, procolopride because procolopride is used in IBS C, constipated because it is an agent that's going to increase the motility, right? Procolopride. So I'm not going to use an IBSD, rather that's a treatment option for IBS C, constipation type. So how will you diagnose IBS based on ROM4 criteria? So you're going to have number one, abdominal pain that's mandatory. It should be there and it should be there for at least three months. Along with that, patient should have uh, the pain that is related to defecation. Second, it should be related to defecation. Okay, pain should be related to defecation. Either the pain will increase with defecation or the pain will decrease with defecation. Doesn't matter. Or the patient can have alteration, change in the stool frequency. Okay, or patients can have alteration in the stool form, consistency. Change in the stool frequency or change in the stool form. So, second point also should be there. Any one should be there. Any one should be there along with abdominal pain so 1 plus 2 so any 1 in the second category so this is the room 4 criteria for the diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome so it's a functional GI disease right so what are the treatment options treatment for all patients fiber will be useful but typically for IBS of C type constipatory type so the most important treatment is going to be increase the fiber in the diet or you can use prokinetic agents like procolopride which is something that we have discussed or you can even metoclopramide and domperidone is fine but procolopride is better option 
or you can use laxatives. What are laxatives? We use lactulose, then uh, polyethylene glycol. So, or you can use modern drugs like lubiprostone. So, you are going to say what is the mechanism action of lubiprostone, and there's another drug called linaclotide. You are going to say what is the mechanism of action of linaclotide, and we have another drug called plecanitide, even that can be used. So, lubiprostone, plec linaclotide, you are going to tell. So, what is the mechanism of action? And we have something called IBS of diarrheal type. How will you treat IBS of diarrheal type? Psyllium husk is a fiber, that's all. So, psyllium husk is just a fiber. So, it's a form of fiber, that's nothing more than that. So, IBSD, IBSD, you're going to use loperamide. Okay, loperamide can be tried. Or alternatively, there's another drug called rifaximin. Rifaximin treatment for 14 days. Rifaximin treatment for 14 days is very, very effective for IBS of diarrheal type, but it's approved only for use in 14 days, not more than that. And there's another drug called as elixardolin. So now people are going to say what is the mechanism of action of elixardolin. Elixardolin. Okay, so these are the options for IBSD. If it's pain type, if you want to reduce pain predominantly, you can use antispasmodics like hyosin, dicyclomen. Okay, currently we use a drug called as mebeverin very commonly in practice, but antispasmodics can be tried and other drugs like TC and SSRIs can be tried as well. So these are the treatment options for IBS of pain type. So IBS of C, so I told you what are the options. In that in exam, usually they will target the lubiprostone linaclotide. In IBS D, the usual target will be on the rifaximin component. In IBS D, the usual target will be your antispasmodics. Yes, yeah, dicyclomen, then hyosin, that is, you know, like you use buscopan, right, very commonly in your practice. Or you can use, uh, uh, what is that, uh, mebeverin, okay, that is what we use commonly, the, or I get only the brand names commonly, that's called cholesterol retard, but the drug that we use commonly is mebeverin, okay, so that's what is the active drug in that. So anyways, the right answer for this is procolopride. Allocetron, yes, it can be used for IBS of diarrheal type. So, in fact, you can try 5-HT3 antagonists, so which are nothing but allocetron, ondansetron, but allocetron is having high risk of colonic necrosis and perforation. So, some people say it should not be used, but if, if, you, if you want, you can use allocetron, loperamide, yes, even cholestamine has been tried in IBS of diarrheal type. That can be tried, has been proven to be effective. So, you can also try something called as bile acid sequestrants bile acid sequestrants when it comes to IBS of diarrheal type, you can try. So drugs like cholesterol. So IBSC, IBSD and severe pain, how will you manage? The right answer for this question is procloprate because it's a prokinetic and it should be used for IBS of constipation, not for diarrhea. So coming to question four, a 59 year old female develops acute diabetic lytis and hospitalized for IV antibiotics, a CT scan shows, does not show evidence of abscess, perforation, stricture or fistula and she improves in about a week. Which of the following should be advised at discharge? Annual colonoscopy, initiation of high fiber diet, subtotal colectomy, daily mesalamine therapy. So which of the following is something that has to be advised at the time of discharge? Waiting for your answers. So here is a patient who had developed uncomplicated diverticulitis. Okay. This is an uncomplicated diverticulitis. This patient is not having a complicated diverticulitis. Many people are answering A. See, yes, colonoscopy should be done for sure. There's no doubt about that, but it should be done at around six weeks' time. Six weeks' time. This is to rule out colon cancer, colorectal cancer. Because many people will say that uh, investigation of choice for diverticulosis is they will say barium enema where you see the sawtooth appearance. But clinically speaking, as a clinician, the most important investigation in a patient with diverticulosis is colonoscopy. Why? Because there could be some tumor hiding under the like uh, diverticula. So I have to rule out tumor. So that's why at six weeks time, common practice recommendation is to do col colonoscopy after any attack of diabetic, diabetic lytis, you have to do colonoscopy in another six weeks. Acutely, you're not going to do colonoscopy because acutely, if you're going to do colonoscopy, things are going to be bad because it can result in perforation also. Okay, so what you do is you wait 
for six weeks. Within six weeks time, you have to do a colonoscopy to rule out colorectal cancer. It's not annual colonoscopy. That's wrong. Subtotal colectomy is also incorrect because we are going to do surgery only in complicated disease. Surgery if non-resolution of abscess, non-resolving abscess or if there is other complications like perforation, fistula, more than perforation, if there are peritoneal signs, even perforation also, if it's a contained perforation, it can be managed more medically. If it's a peritoneal contamination, okay, if the patient is having peritoneal signs, okay, perforation of the patient is having peritonitis, peritoneal signs due to peritonitis, there you are going to do surgery, open up. Or if the patient is having complicated fistula formations, okay, here you can do surgery. Otherwise, I'm not going to do surgery. There's no doubt about that. So even for abscess, remember, they'll ask you one more thing. If they say abscess, and if it's more than 4 cm, you have to intervene. If it's less than 4 cm, size of abscess, you can just treat with antibiotics alone. That's enough. So here you have to intervene and give antibiotics, but if it's less than 4 cm, you can just treat with antibiotics. Only if it's going to be more than 4 cm, you have to intervene and give antibiotics. So that to what intervention you're going to do? You're going to only percutaneously aspirate. Percutaneously aspirate. Okay. Percutaneous aspiration. That's going to be the one that's going to be done. In case if the patient is having non-resolving abscess, you have tried draining percutaneously but it's not working, then only you are going to go for surgery. Or if the patient is having peritoneal signs like uh, it has leaked into the peritoneum causing peritonitis, okay, so then you can do surgery. Otherwise, why you want to do surgery? You can wait, you can manage conservatively. In fact, most of the diverticulitis colitis patients will be managed conservatively. So if this is not a patient where you need to go for a subtotal colectomy. Daily mesalamine therapy, why? Because there has been some trials which uh, has been done on mesalamine therapy and diverticulitis and mesalamine therapy has not shown to reduce the incidence of diverticulitis so that's not correct. Initiation of high fiber diet will be the option because the main reason for diverticulosis and sub sub subsequent diverticulitis is uh, low fiber diet. So you have to definitely start initiating high fiber diet. Previously they have said like nuts should not be used in patients with diverticulosis. This is incorrect. Nuts can be used in patients with diverticulosis and that doesn't increase the risk of diverticulitis. That was an anecdotal thought that nuts will increase the risk of diverticulitis in a patient with diverticulosis but it's not the case. That's quashed uh, like long time ago. And you should not use steroids. Steroids have to be very carefully used in a patient with diverticulitis because steroids increase the risk of perforation, diverticulitis and subsequent diverticular perforation. So if at all you want to use steroids, be careful because this can increase the risk of diverticular disease related perforation. So you have to be very very careful with steroids in patients with diverticulosis. So all of the three options, A, C and D are wrong. The only right answer is option number B. So initiation of high fiber diet is the one that should be done in patients with uncomplicated diverticulitis. Somebody is asking what is the investigation of choice for diverticulosis. I don't understand like uh, there is no investigation of choice as such. Uh, you can diagnose diverticulosis with CT scan, you can diagnose diverticulosis with barium enema, you can diagnose diverticulosis with colonoscopy also. There is no standard investigation of choice for diagnosing diverticulosis as such but it's not at all relevant also because diverticulosis Diagnosis is not at all like going to have any clinical impact. What is more important is if you diagnose diverticulosis, it's very important to rule out cancer. That's why colonoscopy is mandatory for all patients. Especially the moment you make a diagnosis of diverticulosis or diverticulitis, you have to try and do colonoscopy as soon as possible because these are old people, most of them, and they can have underlying cancer. Okay, be very careful. And diverticulitis, yes, it's a CECT scan. It's a contrast CT scan. That's going to be the most important investigation. Okay, CT is the best. Diverticulitis. Okay, for diverticulosis, maybe. If you are undergrad, you can go for barium minimum. Coming to question number 5, you have a 54-year-old man presenting with 1 month of diarrhea. He states that he has 8 to 10 loose bowel movements a day. He has lost approximately around 6 kgs during this time. Vital signs and physical examination are normal. Serum lab studies are normal. A 24-hour stool collection reveals 500 gram of stool with a measured stool osmolality of 200 milliosmoles per liter and calculated stool osmolality of 210 milliosmoles per liter. Based on this finding, which are the following is the most likely cause of his diarrhea. Is it celiac sprue or is it chronic pancreatitis or is it going to be 
uh, lack test deficiency or is it going to be VIP tumor? So which is the most likely diagnosis based on the given clinical data. The clue here is very, very simple. So it's the stool osmolality that's going to give you the clue technically. Okay, technically celiac sprue and chronic pancreatitis should have caused a fatty diarrhea. Okay, so that's different. So that's totally different. This is not the case. Here the real difference and confusion is between lactose deficiency and VIP tumor. This can be easily differentiated by looking at the stool osmolol cap. You can easily differentiate with the help of stool osmolol cap. So what is the ideal stool osmolol cap which will tell you whether it is lactose deficiency or VIP tumor. Remember lactose deficiency is going to produce osmotic diarrhea. VIP tumor is going to produce secretory diarrhea. And what will be the stool osmolal gap in the setting of osmotic diarrhea and secretory diarrhea? If it's secretory diarrhea, stool osmolal gap will be less than 50. If it's osmotic diarrhea, stool osmolal gap will be more than 125. So this is going to be the stool osmolal gap. In secretory diarrhea, it's going to be less than 50. So it's very clear that the patient's uh, measured stool osmolality. Measured stool osmolality is 20 and patient's calculated stool osmolality is 210. 210. So 210 minus 200 is just 10. The stool osmol gap is just 10. So that clearly tells you that it must be a secretory diarrhea. So in this case, the likely diagnosis is going to be the VIP tumor. That's the likely diagnosis. Okay. So lactose deficiency should have caused a stool osmol gap of more than 125. That's not the case here. There are no findings that are consistent with chronic pancreatitis or celiac sprue because in chronic pancreatitis you should have diabetes, you should have abdominal pain, chronic abdominal pain. That's not there. There is no diagnosis that is consistent with celiac sprue. There is no history with regards to gluten hypersensitivity. So there's uh, there, there's nothing like that to substantiate celiac sprue. So that's not the case here. So it's easily going to rule out celiac sprue and chronic pancreatitis. The right answer for this question is D, VIP tumor. So how will you evaluate a chronic diarrhea? So many times in exam, they may ask you this kind of question because it's based on malabsorption. So chronic diarrhea will be differentiated into something called as watery diarrhea. And then we have something called as fatty diarrhea. And we have something called as inflammatory diarrhea. Inflammatory diarrhea. So what are the uh, different watery diarrheas? We have something called as secretory diarrhea. We have something called as osmotic diarrhea. And we have something called as functional diarrhea. Functional diarrhea in the sense conditions like IBS, okay, irritable bowel syndrome. So if you look at the osmolal gap, so what will be the osmolal gap? In secretory diarrhea, as I told you, it's going to be less than 50. In osmotic diarrhea, it will be more than 125. In functional diarrhea, it will be somewhere around 50 to 100. Not less than 50, not more than 125. It will be somewhere in between. In fatty diarrhea and inflammatory diarrhea, there's nothing to talk about osmolal gap in the first place because there are going to be other like like proper like uh, clinical picture will be there like patient will have like gluten hypersensitivity if it is celiac disease ibd means they will have like bloody diarrhea so there should be something so there's no need to mention about that there so it's going to be more helpful only in watery diarrhea not in fatty diarrhea or inflammatory diarrhea so is there relationship with food intake is there relationship with food intake so if it's going to be secretory diarrhea no there's no relationship with food intake because there is some compound that is increasing the secretion of the intestine. So there is no relationship. Osmotic diarrhea, yes. Unless until you have food, you are not going to get osmotic diarrhea. For example, lactose intolerance, lactase deficiency. If you take milk, then only you are going to get diarrhea. Otherwise, you are not going to get diarrhea. Functional may or may not. It does. I mean, that's going to stand in between. And what about fatty diarrhea? Yes. If you don't take food, you cannot get fat malabsorption. Patient will not get diarrhea. Inflammatory, no, because there is some inflammatory disease going on. There will be no relationship with food. Whether they eat or they don't eat, doesn't matter. They will pass tools. So nocturnal symptoms, that's very, very important. Whether symptoms will occur in the night or not. No, I mean, yes, secretory diarrhea, because compound is increasing the secretion in the gut. It's going to act 24 by 7. Inflammatory, yes, because it's a pathological problem. Inflammation, that doesn't see day and night. Fatty diarrhea, Nocturnal symptoms may or may not be there depending on the patient's intake that's 
controversial, but here definitely you no know, osmotic diarrhea because patient doesn't take food. If they don't eat milk, if they don't drink milk, lactose deficiency will not cause diarrhea in the night. Similarly, functional diarrhea it's a functional problem. Like IBS patient tends to sleep in the night. So how can they get diarrhea in the night? That is why presence of nocturnal symptoms is a red flag sign that rules out IBS. Remember, in the presence of nocturnal symptoms, don't diagnose IBS. There are some IBS red flags. So what are the IBS red flags? Anemia, weight loss, family history of some gastrointestinal cancer, old age patients, like age more than 50, never diagnose IBS. Or patients are having nocturnal symptoms, can never diagnose IBS. Fecal occult blood positive, never diagnose IBS. These are red flags for IBS. I'll repeat, old age people, iron deficiency anemia, stool occult blood positive, nocturnal symptoms, family history of colorectal cancer, okay, never diagnose. Okay, so these are red flags for IBS. You should not do that. Okay, these are going to be the characteristic features. What are the etiologies basically? The most important etiologies. It's going to be secondary. Plenty of etiologies are there. Plenty, plenty. But most importantly, in exams, they will expect neuroendocrine tumors. Okay, neuroendocrine tumors. The best example for that is VIPoma. For that matter, even Zollinger Ellison syndrome can cause diarrhea. Go and look at the triad of Zollinger Ellison syndrome. Very commonly, it's going to cause diarrhea. It's one of the important manifestations. And it could be due to villous adenomas, large villous adenomas. This is also something that's asked in exams. There's a separate syndrome with regards to that. That will be asked in exams as well. Okay. And hyperthyroidism, hyperthyroid status, Addison disease causing abdominal pain and diarrhea. It's a kind of secretory diarrhea only endocrine problems, diabetes and autonomic neuropathy, diabetes and autonomic neuropathy, okay, diabetes and autonomic neuropathy. See, many people are asking about infections, will it fit in where? So remember, infections will fit under inflammatory diarrhea, right? Infections fit under inflammatory diarrhea. So they're going to come under secretory diarrhea. Okay, diabetes and autonomic neuropathies. And last but not least, there is a disease called as microscopic colitis. I don't know how many of you know about this disease. This is very, very important. This is a very important disease. In exam, if they give a patient with chronic diarrhea, chronic diarrhea, normal colonoscopy, normal colonoscopy, always think about microscopic colitis. This can be proven only by biopsy. In the biopsy, you will see lymphocytic infiltrate in the lamina propria. That's the only way to prove that the patient is having microscopic colitis. Otherwise, you cannot prove microscopic colitis. That's a very, very important point, okay? Chronic diarrhea, normal colonoscopy, biopsy showing inflammatory, lymphocytic infiltrate in the lamina propria region. That is microscopic colitis. Very, very common in uh, community. And what about osmotic diarrhea? What are the common causes? Lactose intolerance. Lactose intolerance or lactase deficiency. Second one will be um, laxative abuse. Laxatives. That's the usual cause. What are the functional diarrhea? IBS of diarrheal type. Okay, IBSD is the usual reason for functional diarrhea. What about fatty diarrhea? It's divided into two. One is called as malabsorption. Second one is called as maldigestion. The best example of malabsorption will be celiac disease. That's the best example. Apart from that, you have plenty of examples. Uh, short bowel syndrome, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Okay, many conditions are there. Best example of maldigestion will be pancreatic problem, pancreatic exocrine problem, pancreatic exocrine defect. So that is chronic pancreatitis. That's an exocrine problem, right? So it's maldigestion. Inflammatory, the best example is inflammatory bowel disease, infections, chronic infections of the gut. But the most important example is going to be like IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. So these are all going to be the examples of inflammation causing chronic diarrhea. So that's how you're going to stratify, okay? So this is a question completely based on chronic diarrhea. And each and everything has some testing, okay? So for malabsorption, maldigestion, so for each and everything you have testing separately. I'm not going to talk about that right now. So here's a question number six. A patient with a five-year history of ulcerative colitis presents with acute abdominal pain. Workup reveals fever and leukocytosis. Plain phlegm is shown below. Which of the following is the next management? Is it IV methylprednisolone or is it infliximab or is it cyclosporin or is it subtotal colectomy? Look at the plain phlegm x-ray and you can see what's going on. See what's happening. See what's happening. See what's happening and answer.
Okay, you have seen, now you can answer. So what is the diagnosis? Diagnosis is technically toxic megacolon. Okay, this is a diagnosis that's toxic megacolon. What we do for toxic megacolon, I don't know why many of the students, I mean, I don't, I don't know really like what surgeons are basically teaching, but understand that uh, if it's Toxic megacolon due to any cause. Usually two causes will be there. One is IBD, second is Clostrum difficile colitis. These are two things that produce toxic megacolon very commonly in the community. First is always conservative. You straight away don't just go and operate and remove the colon. Because whenever I ask about toxic megacolon, okay, st students tell that uh, you have to do surgery. No, no. So first start with conservative therapy, IVMPS, because this is a patient with ulcerative colitis. And first start with IVMPS, that's the first line therapy. Then try with infliximab or cyclosporin. That's the next step. Okay, try infliximab or cyclosporin. If it still doesn't work, then go for subtotal colectomy. That's the third option. So in any patient with severe ulcerative colitis, especially with toxic myocolon, first line is going to be your IV steroids, MPS. We're asking about the next management. Okay, so that's IV steroids. Then try infliximab, cyclosporin. If it doesn't work, then go for subtotal colectomy. So subtotal colectomy will not be done unless and until patient has a failure of steroid and one of the agents like infliximab or cyclosporin. Then only you're going to go for colectomy. I don't know, study in any textbook for that matters. This is what will be given. So what do you mean by toxic megacolon? So diameter of the colon will be more than 6 cm but without obstruction, without obstruction, without evidence of mechanical obstruction plus evidence of systemic inflammation, plus evidence of systemic inflammation. So more than 6 cm without evidence of, without obstruction and evidence of systemic inflammation. So remember, Somebody is asking if unstable, then the answer will be subtotal colectomy. So you, first you stabilize the patient, you give fluids, you stabilize the patient and you are going to treat again with steroids only. That's going to be the first line treatment even if the patient is unstable. In case if the patient is having peritoneal signs, hard signs, suggesting perforation, peritoneal disease, then you go for surgery. Otherwise, why you want to unnecessarily take the patient for surgery? It's not required generally in most cases, even if the patient is unstable, in hemodynamic shock. This is not a condition like RTA, this is not a condition like blunt abdominal trauma where if you see fast positive straight away, you take the patient for surgery if the patient is unstable. If mesalamine is given, see, we're not going to use mesalamine in a patient with toxic myocolon. You have to urgently give IV steroids. So this is toxic myocolon, diameter more than 6 cm without evidence of mechanical obstruction plus evidence of systemic inflammation like fever, elevated CRP. So these are going to be the features of toxic megacolon. Here the patient is having evidence of systemic inflammation, fever and leukocytosis. Patient is having dilatation of the colon, okay, more than 6 cm dilatation with no evidence of mechanical obstruction. This is toxic megacolon. Answer is IV methylprednisolone. That's it. Coming to the next one, so 74 year old woman underwent a hip surgery and on post operative day number 2, she complains of increasing abdominal discomfort and distension. On physical examination, she is afebrile with a BP of 140-80, heart rate is 110, respiratory rate is 16, SpO2 is 100% on 2 liter O2. She has a distended tympanitic abdomen with absent bowel sounds. There is no rebound tendency. X-ray is shown. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Look at what's happening. So this patient underwent a hip surgery, okay? On period number two, complaints of increasing abdominal discomfort and distension on physical examination. She's afebrile, no problem at all. Everything is fine. She's having only distended tympanic abdomen with absent bowel sounds. There's no rebound tenderness. So what's happening here? Look at this. What's going on?
I've shown the x-ray. Now it's your turn. First of all, what are you are seeing? Uh, technically, you are seeing large bowel or small bowel? Oh, here. Yeah. You are seeing large bowel or small bowel? This is large bowel or small bowel? Guys? Yes, these are technically small bowel, right? So what I'm seeing is small bowel. That's correct. Okay. So it's straightforward. This is going to be a small bowel ileus. That's all. Nothing more than that. It's a small bowel ileus. In colonic pseudo obstruction, you're going to see only small bowel. I mean, only large bowel. You're not going to see the small bowel. So if you're going to see small bowel alone, okay, so not... Uh, any without any signs of obstruction that's going to be small bowel ileus if you're going to see large bowel enlargement dilatation without any evidence of obstruction that's going to be colonic pseudo obstruction otherwise called as ogilvy syndrome if it's going to be intestinal perforation you should see air under the diaphragm i'm not able to see any air under the diaphragm look at this patient this this is the fundus okay i'm not able to see any air under the diaphragm whatsoever so this is definitely not perforation Okay, so technically this is nothing but a small bowel ileus. Very, very common. This this is also something we are going to call it as a post-operative ileus. That's all. This is a simple post-op ileus. That's all. This is very, very common. This is how the exam questions will be framed many times. Common scenarios, common situations, simple x-rays. A calculus cholesteroids and like it's not going to present like this. You're going to have abdominal pain predominantly like in the right hypochondrial region so that's not the case here and patients will be having other signs like fever and all those things so look at this one you're reviewing a serology report of a patient in a routine mhc hbsag is negative anti hbc is negative anti hbc is positive hb eag is negative anti hb is negative all of the following are true except the patient is in window period patient is having late acute infection or occult hbv infection or hbv in the remote past so the following is correct. So which means this patient is having isolated anti-HBC positivity. So only anti-HBC is positive, nothing else is positive. Which of the following is false? That's what I'm asking. So if anti-HBC alone is positive, it could be either IgM or it could be IgG. If it's IgM positive, usually indicates a window period. If it's IgG positive, okay, it's going to indicate occult HBV infection. Occult HBV infection. For both these, you have to confirm with HBV DNA. HBV DNA will be low level positive. Low level positive in both these things. HBV DNA will be low level positive. And in HBV infection of the remote past also, anti-HBC can be positive, even in resolved HBV infection. Another reason for Ig positivity will be resolved HBV infection, resolved infection. Even in this regards also, anti-HBC IgG will be positive. So the only place where this picture will not fit into is late acute infection, where you will definitely have HBCG positivity. The moment you talk about acute HBSAG will be positive. The right answer for this question is going to be option B. So let me tell you in the algorithmic fashion. First, what are you going to see? You're going to see surface antigen. That's what you're going to see. Surface antigen can be positive or surface antigen can be negative. I told you so many times. Surface antigen, this the same algorithm I explained to you. Surface antigen may be positive or surface antigen may be negative. If surface antigen is positive, what is the next step that you're going to look for? Look at anti-HBC. Okay, look at anti-HBC, whether it is IgM type or IgG type, that's what I'm going to look for. Surface antigen positive, anti-HBC IgM 
positive indicates usually acute infection okay usually indicates an acute infection both are positive surface antigen positive anti hbc igg positive what does it indicate it indicates usually a chronic infection it is going to tell you that the patient is having a chronic infection okay in case if anti hbc is negative what does it indicate surface antigen is positive but anti hbc is negative this is a very rare situation this is a rare situation anti hbc is negative what does it indicate usually it will be a false positive hbsag very commonly so repeat repeat hepatitis b surface antigen repeat hepatitis b surface antigen in this regards it will usually be a false positive or alternatively ask for history of recent vaccination recent vaccination means like uh, yesterday or today something like that maybe in the last one week because what you are going to do with the vaccine you are going to introduce surface antigen only that can be circulating in the blood and that can result in this false positive surface antigen but because this is not a true viral exposure the and the anti hbc will be negative in this regards so whenever the patient is having positive surface antigen negative anti hbc think about a false positive surface antigen but if anti hbc is positive and if it's igm positive or igg positive you can diagnose whether it's an ac acute infection or a chronic infection in chronic infection the most important step is to look at the e antigen i think everyone of you will know so e antigen positive e antigen negative e antigen positive means low infectivity e antigen negative means high infectivity that's all and this is important for community because most of the chronic infection most of the people who are infected chronically only they are going to transmit the infection in the community so that's why this is important for community and apart from that activity will be diagnosed with the help of alt values so see alt in any chronic hbv infection look at the alt if it's elevated it's active or in biopsy if you see hepatitis it's active if alt is normal it is inactive that's all the activity will be determined either by liver enzymes or by biopsy reports you cannot say activity based on your uh, e antigen status so that's how you categorize surface antigen negative right if surface antigen is negative what is the next step look at anti hbc again so anti hbc can be negative or anti hbc can be positive surface antigen negative anti hbc also negative which means patient has not been exposed to the virus in the past and your surface antigen is also negative so what does that mean so now look at anti hbs anti hbs is what you need to look at so if anti hbs is positive it indicates patient is protected it's a vaccinated status if anti hbs is negative it indicates not protected non vaccinated state is non exposed at the same time non vaccinated also non exposed non vaccinated no infection he has not been exposed in the past and he is not having any protection also from immunity no vaccination so this is what it indicates so if anti hbc is positive what do you have to see surface antigen negative but anti hbc positive see whether it is a igm fraction or igg fraction if it's going to be igm fraction if it's going to be igm fraction it indicates window period it indicates window period if it's going to be igm fraction igm fraction window period if it's going to be igg fraction it's going to indicate two things either patient has recovered which means previously has been exposed but now cleared the virus he has recovered or alternatively there is an entity called occult hbv infection this is what is given in harrison occult hbv infection occult hbv means he is on the way towards recovery remember he is on the way towards recovery so both window period and occult hbv indicates these patients are on the way to recovery so when i am having acute infection and i am moving towards recovery okay that is window period 
if I'm having chronic infection and if I'm moving towards recovery, that is occult HBV. I'll repeat, acute infection on the way to recovery, window period. Chronic infection on the way to recovery, occult HBV. How do you differentiate in both these situations? DNA levels will be low positive. If you do ultra sensitive DNA assays, DNA levels may be low positive. If you do only qualitative assist, whether DNA positive or negative, sometimes it can be negative. But it could be very low positive in both window period as well as occult HPV, but it it's very much variable. So, but what you see is only anti-HBC positive. So, whenever you have isolated anti-HBC positivity, this is what you need to think. Okay. Recovery is what you mean by HPV infection in the remote past. Remote past means I have got infection a very long ago and I have recovered from that infection. That's what I indicate. So, my evidence of exposure will be there. That is in the form of anti-HBC. Okay, that is IgG, Ig positive. Do you understand or not? I think you will be able to get it now. So this is a very elegant and a good algorithm that will tell you everything. So in case, what I am saying is, in my case, okay, in my case, surface antigen is negative and anti-HBC is positive. That's what I am seeing. Surface antigen is negative and anti-HBC is positive, which means it could be window period, it could be occult HBV infection or it could be HBV in the remote past, which means I have recovered from it, but it cannot be late acute infection. If it's going to be late acute infection, surface antigen will be positive. I know, whatever may be the acute infection, if that is the case, surface antigen should be positive. You cannot get uh, acute infection without positive surface antigen. Okay, now I think you can understand. So what's going on here? So that's why the right answer, all of the following are true except answer is option B. Late acute infection cannot be the possibility. So now please like study this like algorithm carefully. So this algorithm itself will help you understand like uh, what's going on in different different situations. Okay, now going to the next question. So hope you are clear. Which of the following is incorrect with regards to Drug-induced liver injury. DILI stands for drug-induced liver injury. So direct toxic hepatitis is usually clinically indistinguishable from viral hepatitis. Idiosyncratic reactions are unpredictable and is not dose dependent. The occurrence of jaundice in a phase 3 clinical trial is predictive of severe hepatotoxicity in post-marketing surveillance. The incidence of DILI is the same in patients with chronic liver disease. Which of the following is incorrect with regards to drug-induced liver injury? So what is your answer? I am waiting for your answers. So what's your answer? Okay. So now we are talking about something called as DILI, that is drug induced liver injury. So let us dissect step by step. These are all statements from Harrison, straight, straight, straight statements from Harrison, nothing more than that. So direct toxic hepatitis is usually clinically indistinguishable from viral hepatitis. That's actually wrong statement. Okay. So whenever you talk about drug-induced liver injury, there are two forms of drug-induced liver injury. One is called as direct toxicity, direct toxicity. Second is idiosyncratic reaction. Second is idiosyncratic reaction. We don't know the reason for toxicity. The best example for direct toxic effect is astomnophen, parastomol poisoning. We tend to produce very characteristic picture. We know that in uh, biopsy, you are going to see something called a centrilobular necrosis, which means the toxins, the direct toxic effect, the direct toxins will have some characteristic identity in the liver biopsy that I am the one who is producing the injury. That signature will be there. But idiosyncratic direct toxic effects are predictable. You know, these are basically predictable. Which means you know what is the dose relationship. Best example is again astomnophen. You know like if you take beyond 10 gram, the risk is very high. More than 12 gram, the risk is very, very high. So you know that. So there is a predictable effect. And you know the dose relationship. It's dose dependent, predictable. And it's dose dependent. Whereas idiosyncratic reactions are not dose dependent. It can occur at any dose. Even at usual doses that we use in therapeutic practice, we can see these reactions. And they don't have any specific pattern and they are not predictable. 
they are unpredictable they can occur in any individual that we use this drug upon and it is non specific the biopsy will be non specific it can mimic a viral hepatitis also it will be non specific we don't have any specific injury pattern with idiosyncratic reactions so first statement is absolutely wrong okay direct toxic hepatitis is usually clinically indistinguishable from viral hepatitis that's wrong idiosyncratic reactions are the ones that are clinically indistinguishable direct toxic hepatitis will be like producing some signature changes like central lobular necrosis and parastomal poisoning idiosyncratic reactions are unpredictable and not dose dependent that's correct right statement i told you and incidence of dili in patients with cld is the same as that of patients without cld that's absolutely correct that's true so drug induced liver injury risk is the same in patient with chronic liver disease and the patient without chronic liver disease so i'm not going to get more risk of uh, liver injury just because like uh, i'm having a chronic liver disease that's a very important statement that's correct number of c is the occurrence of jaundice in phase 3 clinical trial is predictive of severe hepatotoxicity in post marketing salvage that's correct so why i mentioned this specifically is because this could be a future question because this is something that is given in harrison as something called as high's rule there is something called as high's rule that's always called as hyman zimmerman rule is one of the pioneers in the drug induced liver injury field you can search his search his name in the google his name is hyman zimmerman that's called as high's rule he said that for every one case of severe hepatotoxicity okay for every one case of severe hepatotoxicity that occurs in the clinical trials in the post marketing trials you are going to see 10 cases of jaundice 10 cases of jaundice so the ratio is going to be 10 is to 1 the ratio is 10 is to 1 or 1 is to 10 whatever way you want to say so for every one case of severe hepatotoxicity in the clinical trials you are going to see 10 cases of jaundice in post marketing studies in post marketing studies once you release the drug you are going to see 10 cases it's equal to 10 cases of jaundice that's called 10 is to 1 highs rule or always called as hyman zimmerman rule so this could be a future exam question they might ask you where you apply hyman zimmerman rule or highs rule it's for dili drug induced liver injury for every one case of severe hepatotoxicity in the clinical phase 3 clinical trial it's going to translate into 10 cases of jaundice once you release that drug in the market so that is hyman zimmerman rule or high's rule so all these three are correct so option b idiosyncratic reactions are unpredictable not dose dependent correct occurrence of jaundice in phase 3 clinical trial is predictive of severe hepatotoxicity in post marketing surveillance high's rule that's correct incidence of drug induced liver injury is the same as that of chronic liver disease that's correct the risk in chronic liver disease patient is not going to be any different than the risk in uh, patients who don't have cld that's a true statement so first statement is wrong so the right answer for this question is going to be option a going to the 10th question a 34 year old woman is evaluated for fatigue malaise arthralgia and 10 pound weight loss over the past 6 to 8 weeks she has no past medical history on examination vitals are stable and she has hepatomegaly jaundice and mild joint swelling labs shows alt of 542 you can see that ast is 542 alt is 657 alp is 102 total bilirubin room is 5.3 direct bilirubin room is 4.8 which of the following test should be uh, would be least likely to be positive in this diagnosis which of the following test is least likely to be positive least likely to be positive that's the question so what is the answer least likely to be positive ana rheumatoid factor ama hyper gamma globulin which of the following is going to be and which of the following will be least likely to be positive ana rheumatoid factor anti mitochondrial antibody and hyper gamma globulinemia so what is the diagnosis first of all here the diagnosis is very likely to be primary biliary cirrhosis or primary biliary cholangitis that's the diagnosis okay so nobody is answering yes that's correct so because the diagnosis primary biliary cholangitis ana is very unlikely to be positive okay so rheumatoid factor can be positive ama can be positive hyper gamma globulin can be there okay but oh sorry no 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 so i made a fuss about the diagnosis diagnosis is autoimmune hepatitis diagnosis autoimmune hepatitis it's not uh, 
parameter builder calling it is because I, I mean I got a little like carried away with a lot of other issues going on in the phone. Nevertheless, so why it is autoimmune hepatitis? First of all, you need to see the pattern. So here is a young female who's present with autoimmune hepatitis. Typical picture. So what is the pattern? So let us see three disorders. One is going to be autoimmune hepatitis. Second is primary biliary cirrhosis. Third one is going to be primary sclerosing cholangitis (PSC). So how they will present? Autoimmune hepatitis is going to have a hepatocellular pattern. I'll tell you what do you mean by hepatocellular pattern. Primary biliary, biliary cholangitis will be having a cholestatic pattern. Cholestatic pattern. Primary sclerosing cholangitis also is going to have a cholestatic pattern. Okay. So hepatocellular cholestatic cholestatic. That's going to be the pattern. So what do you mean by hepatocellular pattern? Hepatocellular pattern means there will be more AST and ALT elevation. There will be significant AST ALT elevation, but relatively normal or only mild increase in ALP will be there. But the main problem will be AST ALT elevation. But when it comes to your cholestatic pattern, you are going to have normal or only mild increase in AST and ALT. AST and ALT, but the main problem will be increase in the ALP and the GGT. So this is going to be the cholestatic pattern. But AST and ALT will be normal or only mildly elevated. That's the cholestatic pattern. So this patient, our patient in question, is having AST of 542, ALT of 657, ALP of 102. Okay, which means ALP normal is less than 140. Normal ALP is less than 140 or less than 120. This is absolutely normal. ALP is normal. So leave the bilirubin. So our patient in question is having a hepatocellular pattern. You can notice the AST in ALT is the one that is very high. Okay, so that's hepatocellular pattern. So we are basically talking about autoimmune hepatitis. So what is the antibody that's going to be positive? ANA will be positive. Smooth muscle antibody will be positive. Or anti-LKM1 antibody will be positive. Anti-LKM1 antibody will be positive. Or there is another antigen called as anti-soluble liver antigen. Anti-SLA may be positive. Any of this antibody may be positive. And many patients with autoimmune hepatitis will be having hyper gamma globulin. IgG levels will be elevated. This is a very important point. IgG levels will be elevated. So what about primary biliary cirrhosis or primary biliary cholangitis? Here the patients will be having AMA positive that is anti mitochondrial antibody positive. And some patients can have IgM elevation. IgM, not IgG though, but this is not very important. IgM may be positive. And finally, what about uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis? There is no antibody that's known to be positive, even though some books say Pianka will be positive, but this not does not have any relevance when it comes to primary sclerosing cholangitis. Now coming to imaging. Imaging means I'm talking about ERCP and MRCP, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopantrograph and magnetic resonance cholangiopantrograph. ERCP and MRCP will be normal. ERCP and MRCP will be normal. But when it comes to primary sclerosing cholangitis, you're going to see abnormal ERCP and MRCP, where you're going to see strictures, beading of the extrapatic biliary tract. Okay, strictures and beading are very, very common, right? And you know that primary sclerosing cholangitis, yes, many people are commenting, it usually has a history of inflammatory bowel disease, especially ulcerative colitis. And primary sclerosing cholangitis has increased risk of development of cholangiocarcinoma. Increased risk of cholangiocarcinoma. Okay, they can develop cholangiocarcinoma also. So these are going to be the differential features. So clearly, our patient is having multiple manifestations: fatigue, malaise, arthralgias. He's having weight loss. So all this is telling that this patient is having some autoimmune problem, autoimmune liver disease. And what is that disease? That is autoimmune hepatitis because that is the one that fits into the hepatocellular pattern. If it's primary biliary cholangitis, it should be cholestatic pattern. ALP should have been high. That's not the case. If it's primary sclerosing cholangitis also, ALP should be high. That's not the case. So we are talking about autoimmune hepatitis here. So in autoimmune hepatitis, ANA will be positive. Rheumatoid factor will be positive. Patients can have elevated IgG, hypergamma globulinemia. But what will not be seen? AMA. Because this is something that is seen in primary biliary cholangitis, PBC. And not in autoimmune hepatitis just a while ago we discussed right you can you're going to see this in primary biliary cholangitis so based on the diagnosis okay that is autoimmune hepatitis the right answer for this question is option c that is anti mitochondrial antibody that is seen in primary biliary cirrhosis and not in patients with autoimmune hepatitis 
So first of all, you need to know how to diagnose this case. Then only you will be able to answer what is the right answer. Okay, otherwise you will not be able to answer it correctly. Okay, all right. So now you can understand. So this is autoimmunabilities and straightforward. Let us move on to the next one. So all of the following statements are true regarding NAFLD, that is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, except. And let me tell you the treatment alone. So what is the treatment for autoimmunabilities? Treatment for autoimmunabilities is going to be steroids, corticosteroids like prednisolone plus, plus or minus azathioprine. I commonly use azathioprine in my practice, but it's optional. Option for uh, this thing, it's UDCA. Okay, it's nothing. Okay, only palliative. So we can do stenting. Stenting for strictures. All of them at end stage liver disease, you are going to go for liver transplantation only. There's no doubt. But initially, what you will do? Corticosteroids plus azathioprine for autoimmune hepatitis, UDC, acid acid for primary biliary cholangitis, and uh, none of them works for PSE. PSE, if there is significant and symptomatic strictures in the biliary tract, you can do ERCP guided stenting. That's the only thing you can do. Ultimately, you have to um, go for liver transplantation only. So that's the treatment. So any one of this can be asked. Okay, all of the following statements are true regarding NAFLD except there is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Bariatric surgery is safe in patients with NFLD. Vitamin E is helpful in reducing state doses. Statins may worsen inflammation in NFLD. There are no therapies approved by FDA for NFLD, which is correct. Again, all are basically Harrison statements only. Yes, bariatric surgery is safe in patients with NFLD because non-alcoholic fatty liver disease usually will be due to underlying metabolic syndrome. Everyone knows that. So you're asking which is false. Bariatric surgery is safe. That's correct. It can be done in patients with NFLD. In fact, it can give a good result in patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because it produces good weight loss. And uh, there are no therapies approved by FDA for some people are answering D. No therapies approved by FDA for NFLD. That's correct. That's true statement. No therapy have been approved by FDA for NFLD. That's true. That's a statement given in Harrison. And that's true. There's no therapy approved so far. Vitamin E may be helpful in reducing state doses. That's also a true statement. Because vitamin E is going to be very helpful in diabetes and patients who are having NAFLD. Vitamin E has been shown to be beneficial. Vitamin D has been shown to be beneficial in this group. And there are other groups that have been other okay, uh, things that have been shown to be beneficial in setting of NAFLD. Statins, okay, metformin, Pyoglutazone, pyoglutazone, currently GLP-1 analogs, it's been going on, GLP-1 receptor analogs, and SGLT-2 inhibitors. Okay, these are the drugs that have been shown to be beneficial in patients with NFLD. So, but in old textbooks, you will see only metformin and pyoglutazone. In that, they will concentrate on pyoglutazone only. Don't forget this in exam. You know, pyoglutazone is basically a PPR gamma agonist. We know that. So that's shown to have beneficial effect in the setting of NAFLD. See how surprising is it? Saraglutazar is there. Saraglutazar is a combined PPR alpha and PPR gamma agonist, but it's not an FDA approved drug. It's very commonly used in India by many practitioners. It's a combined PPR alpha and PPR gamma agonistic drug. It has efficacy, I mean, it has effect of both pyoglutazone and fibrates together, but it is not approved by FDA. It's a dual PPR agonist, correct. So, but in exam, most of the times, don't forget this pyrazone because that is what they're going to ask in exam. Apart from that, bariatric surgery has a very good benefit as well. So, statins may worsen inflammation in NFLD. That's a wrong statement. So, if you have understood my previous statement, I mean, previous question, you will not say that as an answer. So, what we have discussed, I told you incidence of DILI is same as that of patients with chronic liver disease which means the incidence of drug-induced liver injury is same as that of any other chronic liver disease. Please tell NFLD is a chronic liver disease or not. This is an example of chronic liver disease. Do you think statins are going to increase the risk of delay in NFLD? Or statins are going to cause more injury in the setting of NFLD? I clearly said already so many times that delay doesn't occur at high rates in patients with chronic liver disease. It's the same as that of general population. So even if you have correlated that with this, you would have told this answer. So statins or any other drug for that matter is not going to have increased risk of liver injury in the setting of any chronic liver disease. So statins will not worsen inflammation in NFLD. Rather, it's going to be beneficial in the setting of NFLD. And the risk of hepatitis 
with statins is the same as that of general population. If I'm going to get statins, there is some risk. I'm, I'm going to get some hepatitis due to statin use, there is some risk. And patients with chronic liver disease also are going to be at same risk. There's no excessive risk. Okay, coming to question number 12. A 40-year-old cirrhotic patient with increased confusion and increasing ascites, diagnostic paracentesis is performed and reveals a clear fluid of 800 WBCs and 40% PMNs. Which of the following is most indicated? Eighty eight hundred WBCs and forty percent PMNs. Which of the following is most indicated? So here it's pretty simple, straightforward. Don't look at the confusion. Don't look at uh, all these things. Even though patient may be having hepatic enteropathy, the main problem here is a uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, that is SBP. How you diagnose SBP? The neutrophils will be more than two fifty in the acidic fluid. Obviously, culture should be positive, but in exams this much, if you know that's enough, neutrophils more than 150 neutrophils more than 250 so here 800 wbc's right 40 percent pms which means it's 320 so here this patient is having a neutrophil of 320 so 320 so we are actually having a patient with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis the right answer is option c piperacillin tazobactam okay that's all you need to do. so this is based on the icmr data but if you look at textbooks like harrison textbooks like harrison what they have mentioned is Drugs like ceftriaxone or cefetaxim as the first line drugs. But in India, the rates of resistance to third generation cephalosporins are very high, especially when it comes to E. coli, because E. coli is the most common organism in SBP also. The rates of resistance is very high. Uh, that is the reason why ICMR guidelines recommend Viprazole and Tazobactam. But if you encounter options like ceftriaxone or cefetaxim, even that is going to be correct. Okay, large volume parasynthesis is for refractory chronic ascites, not in a patient with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Lactose can be tried for hepatic enteropathy. In fact, the first line treatment for hepatic enteropathy. But here, that's not the primary problem. SBP is the primary problem. That is what is causing the encephalopathy. So treat that first. Ampicillin, septriaxone, and vancomycin is going to be the treatment for meningitis patients. So ampicillin, septriaxone, and vancomycin will be the treatment for meningitis patients, not for patients with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. So the right answer for this question is going to be option C. Now going to the third question, again very easy. 42 year old man with hepatitis B related cirrhosis has ascites requiring frequent large volume paracentesis, which means the large volume paracentesis is one of the treatment options. All of the following are true regarding treatment of ascites except fluid restriction less than two liters per day, furosemide plus pyrinolactone, sodium restriction less than two grams daily. There is no surveil benefit. Tips as tips in the sense like Transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt has no survival benefit compared to large volume paracentesis, which means whether you do large volume paracentesis or you take the patient for tips, that has no survival benefit. Which of the following is false? Which of the following is false? Yes, the first answer itself is basically correct. Fluid restriction less than 2 liters per day, that's something that's not required. When you give fluid restriction to a patient with cirrhosis or uh, heart failure for that matters, only if the patient is having hyponatremia. Only if the patient is having hyponatremia, are going to allow the patient to opt for fluid restriction. Otherwise, there's no need for fluid restriction. You can just go for salt restriction. That's fine. It's a very, very important treatment. Most of the times, refractory ascites will be due to uh, high salt intake. So restrict the salt. That's number one. Second, furosemide and spironolactone usually given in the ratio of 2.5 is to 1. That's the ratio that we use. 40 milligram of spironolactone, 100 milligram of, sorry, I am telling in reverse, 1 is to 2.5, right? So 40 milligram of furosemide, 100 milligram of spironolactone. 80 milligram of furosemide, 200 milligram of spironolactone. 120 milligram of furosemide, 300 milligram of spironolactone. 160 milligram of furosemide, 400 milligram of spironolactone. That's the max you can go. 160 furosemide, 400 spironolactone. So salt restriction furosemide and spironolactone and if somebody asks you what is the most effective drug in cirrhosis to reduce ascites it is spironolactone not furosemide okay that's the most effective drug and the fourth of in refractory cases you can opt for tips but tips has no survival benefit compared to that of large volume paracentesis that is why guidelines say that initially you have to perform large volume paracentesis which means you can repeatedly tap large amounts of fluids as much as possible if it's still refractory, then you can go for tips, but there is no difference in survival compared to repeated large volume paracentesis and uh, tips. 
the only thing that gives survival benefit in this regards is going to be liver transplantation ultimately you know like liver is the one that's failing so you have to ultimately go for liver transplant that's the best treatment ultimately that's the one that's going to improve survival not tips tips has no survival benefit okay compared to the routine management like large volume paracentesis so the right answer for this question is option a fluid restriction you are not going to use unless until patient is hyponatremic coming to option i'm coming to question number 14 a 40 year old alcoholic with ascites and jaundice presents with acute upper gastrointestinal bleeding all of the following are appropriate treatment options except endoscopic varicell ligation octreotide propranolol and tips which of the following is not going to be appropriate treatment option patient is presenting with ascites jaundice and acute uga bleed which is very likely to be a varicell bleed so this is technically a varicell bleed which of the following will not be used Correct, right answer is propranolol. For the patient is present with acute varicell bleed, so propranolol is something that is not recommended. It's only for prophylaxis of varicell bleed. In acute varicell bleed, it can decompensate the patient because it's a beta blocker, negative inotropic drug, and it can decompensate the individual, can reduce the BP further and can worsen the hemodynamic stability. So it should, should not be given in the setting of, yes, acute varicell bleed. So all of the things are options like you can try endoscopic varicell ligation you can give octreotide or terlipresin you can opt for tip salts in refractory cases that's not a problem at all so this is a simple question easy one management of hrs includes all except hrs is epidorenal syndrome please understand it's a diagnosis of exclusion i think in one of my instagram posts if you're following my instagram definitely you should be knowing i posted one of my um clinical pearls just like uh, two three weeks ago i guess where i posted that the most common cause of kidney injury in the setting of liver failure is not hrs it is actually prerenal failure and acute tubular necrosis hrs is a diagnosis of exclusion once only when you rule out all the other cause of ak you can diagnose hrs so what you will do in hrs so the treatment of choice with regards to hrs is going to be albumin and terlipresin albumin with terlipresin or probably you can use octreotide anyone albumin plus terlipresin or you can use octreotide so volume expansion with albumin is definitely right midodrine and octreotide can be used definitely right referral liver transplantation is also right what i'm not going to do is diuresis with furosemide and spinal octane. i cannot do that in fact to diagnose HRS, I have to stop all diuretics. Stop all diuretics, which means the reason for kidney injury may be my di over diuresis. Diuresis can produce prerenal AK. And that's why I have to stop diuretics, then wait for a solution. If it doesn't resolve, then probably I can make a diagnosis of HRS. So one of the first step is to stop all diuretics. Whenever a patient is having HRS, stop all the diuretics. All the diuretics has to be stopped, no matter what. Then you have to give volume expansion with albumin. Then you can use either terlipresin or octreotide. Anyone can be used. Okay, terlipresin or octreotide can be used. Alternative will be midodrine plus octreotide or you can use noradrenaline also. Midodrine or noradrenaline also can be used as alternatives. Midodrine is an alpha 1 agonist, we know that. That's a vasopressor. So alternative to terlipresin is octreotide. Alternative octreotide will be midodrine and noradrenaline. So you can use it's not a problem at all. But you have to stop all diuretics, stop all nephrotoxic drugs. Okay, give fluid. Exp I mean, give volume expansion with albumin. The dose of albumin will be one gram per kilogram. Maximum will be hundred grams over forty eight hours, and then wait for a solution. If it still doesn't resolve, then only you're going to call it as epidurenal syndrome. So this is wrong because i have to stop diuretics i cannot give diuresis that will worsen the renal injury if it's srs def hrs it's definitely going to worsen the injury even further fluid challenge why should i should not give fluid i should not give uh, normal cell because these patients are already volume older i cannot give sodium containing fluid i have to go for salt restriction that's the reason i'm going to expand volume with iv albumin not with normal saline these patients will be volume overloaded man why volume expansion is needed? Because HRS is a type of pre-renal AKI. So, so technically what happens? Let us see what, what's happening here. So you have the liver. 
okay and they have the kidney over here let us assume this is the iota and uh, let us assume this is the kidney blood supply and uh, on the left side you other side you have the intestinal supply so this is the mesenteric supply mesentery so all this mesenteric vasculature are going to become what portal vein and portal vein is going to go to the liver and inside they are going to break down into multiple sinusoids and then they unite together to form hepatic vein which is going to join IVC which is going to join IVC and I can write IVC here hepatic vein to IVC and IVC is going to join back the heart IVC is going to join back the heart and from the heart you are going to get these vessels okay aorta from the heart you are going to get the aorta back so what is the problem basically here so here the problem is there is hypertension portal hypertension which means the blood that is entering the portal vein is not able to move forward that's the problem it's not able to because of the resistance at the sinusoidal level it's a sinusoidal hypertension so the blood accumulates 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 and it's going to accumulate in the portal circulation and it's going to come here it's going to accumulate in the mesentery this is a problem this is what we call it as portal hypertension in the first place so what mesentric vasculature does mesentric vasculature is going to adapt to this excessive blood it's not moving forward so how it adapts it tends to adapt to this portal hypertension by vasodilatation why they are going to produce vasodilatation why they are producing vasodilatation because they have to adapt to that blood that is not moving forward they have to adapt to that excess blood so there is a low resistance area that is created because of the vasodilatation in the mesentery this is called splanchnic vasodilatation so what happens now the blood is going to come see that it's a low resistance area see that it's a low resistance area and it's going to come and pull here technically what's happening is the blood is coming and getting pulled in the mesenteric circulation but it's not going out it cannot go out because of the portal hypertension rather it's pulling 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 in the mesenteric circulation but it's not able to go out which means this is going to worsen the post portal hypertension it's going to increase the portal hypertension even more isn't it so that is the reason why lot of blood are there in the mesenteric circulation but if you look at the overall systemic circuit the amount of blood is very very low now you say that the amount of blood going to the kidneys will be low or high amount of blood going to the kidneys will be low or high it will be low so that is why this is going to result in hypoperfusion to the kidneys and if that hypoperfusion is due to liver failure only you have ruled out all the other causes like diuretics you have ruled out all the other causes okay now you are seeing that the cause of that renal injury is only liver failure now you can diagnose it is hrs that's why first i'm going to volume expand with albumin okay then i can give some splanchnic vasoconstrictor like terlipresin what i'm going to do i'm going to vasoconstrict splanchnic vasoconstriction by giving terlipresin octreotide midodrin alpha 1 agonist vasoconstrictor noradrenaline alpha 1 vasoconstriction so I can give vasoconstrictors like terlipresin, octodor, midodrin, so thereby reducing the entry of like blood into the mesenteric circulation so that I can redistribute the blood to other areas of the body, including the kidneys. That's why this is going to the treatment. I think you can understand. So what's happening over here? Okay, that's the entire idea. So now I think every one of you will get why I should not use diuresis in the setting of HRS. Why I have to volume expand with albin? Why I can't use terlipresin, midodrin, octodor, noradrenaline? So why, I mean, obviously this is ultimate, like uh, final treatment is going to be liver transplant. In fact, that's the best treatment for any cirrhosis related complication or liver failure related complication. Okay, indications for cold treatment. It's coming to the surgical zone. Indi it's, it's an easy one. So five questions will just get through faster. So indications for cholestectomy in uh, gallstone disease are all except. So anomalous pancreatic duct drainage, gallbladder polyp of 11 mm, gallstone of 18 mm and uh, postline gallbladder. So remember gallstones will be operated only if the patient is symptomatic number one if it's asymptomatic what are the areas where you can operate 
anomalous pancreatic ductal drainage. Abnormal anatomy, yes, you can operate. Collaborate polyp of 11 mm, definitely yes, anything more than 1 cm, you can operate, no problem. Porcelain gallbladder, yes, you can operate because this has a high risk of malignancy. Porcelain gallbladder is calcified gallbladder, so that's porcelain gallbladder. Gallstone of 18 mm is wrong because size is more than 2 to 3 cm, then only you are going to operate, otherwise you are not going to operate. So, I don't know, old surgical textbooks will give a cutoff of 2 cm, but the current cutoff is 3 cm. This is the latest. Latest cutoff is 3 cm. Okay, up to 3 cm we can wait. The old surgical textbooks will say 2 cm, okay, but the recent cutoffs is 3 cm. So, only if the gallstone size is more than 2 to 3 cm, you are going to operate. No, 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 no. It's not only because of obstruction. Uh, it's actually because of risk of malignancy also. Large gallstones has a risk of future malignancy. In fact, gallstones is a one of the important risk factor for gallbladder cancer. That's also one reason. So, right answer for this is option C. So, what are the indications for surgery in asymptomatic patient? Anomalous pancreatic drug drainage or abnormal anatomy, uh, polyp more than 1 cm, postline gallbladder and the gallstone size of more than 2 to 3 cm but the modern latest cutoff is 3 cm. Okay, this is another easy one. So, a 46 year old woman presents with a one week history of right upper quadrant pain, intermittent fever and nausea. Labs show elevated total bilirubin, alkaline phosphorus and mild transaminidase. Ultrasound is normal. MRCP is revealing a beaded appearance of intrahepatic and extrahepatic bile ducts with multiple discrete structures. Which of the following lab tests will be most useful? So, remember here the patient is presenting with a PSE like picture. Patient is presenting with uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis like picture. Here the patient is having elevated alkaline phosphatase but only mild transaminidase. I told you already whenever the patient is having elevated ALP with normal or only mildly elevated AST and ALT, it is cholestatic pattern. So cholestatic pattern with MRCP showing beaded appearance of intrahepatic and extrahepatic bile ducts with multiple discrete sectors. So PSE like picture. So one of the important things that you have to rule out in the setting of primary closing cholangitis is IgG4 related disease. That's very very important because a proportion of patients, I didn't write that here, so let me write that here, a proportion of patients with PSC may have an underlying IgG4 related disease. So whenever you make a diagnosis of primary closing cholangitis before Confirming it's a PSC, rule out IgG4 related disease because a proportion of patients with IgG4 related disease may present like a primary sclerosing cholangitis. That's a separate disease. Why it's important? Because primary sclerosing cholangitis have no treatment. You have to go only for palliative stenting. But IgG4 related disease can be treated with steroids, immunosuppression. It will respond very nicely. That's the reason you have to rule out this because it's a treatable problem. PSC is not treatable. Okay. 18th question. So, this is based on physiology, which of the following regarding pancreatic enzyme secretion is incorrect. So, acetylcholine inhibits pancreatic enzyme secretion, that's incorrect. So, that's the right answer because acetylcholine basically stimulates pancreatic enzyme secretion. Everyone knows that all pancreatic enzymes are secreted as zymogens. This is correct. Okay. CCK receptors are not seen on SNR cells. This is also correct. In fact, in human pancreas, we don't see CCK receptors on SNR cells. Rather, how CCK work? CCK work on the vagal nerve endings, vagus, and that secretes acetylcholine and that will act on SNR cells. This is the indirect mechanism. We don't have CCK receptors, cholestokinin receptors in the SNR cells. So, you have a CCK receptors in the vagal nerve endings and that is going to stimulate release of acetylcholine and that is going to act on asnar cells stimulating pancreatic enzyme secretion and enterokinase found on duodenal mucosa activates trypsinogen this is very very correct in fact the first step in pancreatic enzyme activation is activation of trypsinogen to trypsin that is going to activate multiple other enzymes as a cascade so who is activating trypsinogen in the first place that is an enzyme called as enterokinase this is also a previous year question one of the physiology questions they asked so, the right answer for this question is option A. Coming to the next one. All of the following are accepted diagnostic criteria for acute pancreatitis except. 
it's easy because I told you we are entering the surgical zone. That's why I don't want to discuss too much of surgery. So confirmatory findings of acute pancreatic pancreatitis on cross-sectional imaging. That's correct. Elevation of serum amylase or lipase. Correct. Typical abdominal pain in the epigastrium may relate to the back. That's correct. So we have three. Among these three, if you have at least two out of three, it is equal to acute pancreatitis. It is what we call it as acute pancreatitis. PAO2 less than 60 is actually a marker of severity. It is not required for diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. So it is given in Ransom's criteria. Okay. So you have studied Ransom's and Apache score, right? So it's, it's one of the Ransom's criteria. Okay. So PAO2 less than 60 is a marker of severity of acute pancreatitis. It's not going to be important for diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. So diagnostic criteria only three. So in that we learnt another point also, right? Diagnostic criteria, three pointers. Imaging evidence, amylase lipase elevation, abdominal pain. So I'll repeat abdominal pain, amylase lipase elevation, imaging evidence of acute pancreatitis. The best in, first choice investigation is always ultrasound. But the best investigation is contrast CT, okay, CECT. If you want to load necrosis of the pancreas, CECT is better. You know the grading, so Balthazar grading is there, which I'm not going to discuss right now. Right answer is B. Last one, easy one. So that just a question based on nutrition. I have to touch upon all the areas. That's why 25-year-old women with cystic fibrosis diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis, all of the following complications may be seen except. So it's very simple. They have mentioned it as chronic pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis means there will be fat malabsorption. Fat malabsorption means you will not be able to, um, what to say, like uh, absorb the fat soluble vitamins. So there will be A, D, E, and K deficiency. A, D, and K deficiency. So patients are going to have vitamin A deficiency for sure. And we know that chronic pancreatitis is one of the important risk factors for pancreatic cancer. Important risk factor for pancreatic cancer. So any chronic pancreatitis is a risk factor for pancreatic cancer. So that's also ruled out. So patients will be having that complication as well. And what about B12 deficiency? B12 deficiency also will be seen. Why? Because we know what is the mechanics of B12 in the mouth. So B12 will be bound with something called as R binder. So where is R binder coming from? R binder is coming from saliva, salivary glands in the mouth. So there will be B12 R binder combination. So B12 R binder will enter the stomach. In the stomach, you will have addition of intrinsic factor in the stomach. So there will be B12 R binder combination along with intrinsic factor separately. And who is going to separate this R binder from your B12? It's the pancreatic enzymes. Pancreatic enzymes. Okay. These proteases are the ones that are going to separate the B12 from the R binder. And B12 is now going to bind with intrinsic factor after this. Now this will be taken in by the cubulin receptors in the terminal ileum. In the ileum, B12 intrinsic factor complex will be taken in by the terminal ileal cells. So pancreas is very, very important for B12 absorption. So chronic pancreatitis causing severe pancreatic insufficiency can also result in, yes, B12 deficiency. But what will not occur is niacin deficiency. I mean, usually in exam, niacin deficiency will... See, if the patient is taking maize, everyone knows that. Or uh, if the patient is having carcinoid syndrome, where most of the tryptophan will be diverted to produce serotonin rather than production of niacin. Because tryptophan is an essential amino acid. So, you cannot, if you don't take in excess amounts, like in carcinoid syndrome patients, everything will be diverted to produce serotonin. Okay. And uh, there will be very little or nothing will be left for production of niacin. And that's why niacin deficiency is going to pass with carcinoid syndrome, not with chronic pancreatitis. It's a water-soluble vitamin and that's not affected with chronic pancreatitis. The only water-soluble vitamin that is affected in chronic pancreatitis is B12. Okay. Apart from that, none of the water-soluble vitamins are affected in chronic pancreatitis. So you know the mechanism of how B12 deficiency occurs in chronic pancreatitis. So the right answer for this is niacin deficiency. Okay. Cool. Thank you so much, everyone. Basically, today I'm not feeling well in the first place. Uh, hopefully, I maintain the energy throughout. I had like a bad fever and uh, I didn't sleep well last night and I had a very hectic and very busy OPD today. Like I had more than 35, 38 patients today and uh, 
there's so much of impatience but still i tried my best and after coming here like there was a power cut and i have to divert all the ups back to the room where i'm taking the class and there was like today was hell of a ride honestly speaking and hopefully the session was useful and uh, rheumatology and uh, gastroenterology are kind of like overlapping topics so that's the reason why i've like uh, not discussed to, so much of depth and basic stuff about these topics and anyways nevertheless hopefully like whatever questions i have given and whatever questions i have discussed will give you a kind of a good insight with regards to what kind of questions you can expect in exams some questions are basically kind of moderate to tough level kind of questions but many questions i have uh, asked at a very basic level only but like in fact like around 40% of the questions whatever i asked are basically pyqs they are not like questions that are new and majority of the questions in fact all of the questions are straight lines from harrison nothing more than that and thank you very very much see you all soon and uh, wishing you all the very best bye